Welcome to the MMA Roadshow, episode number 58. My name is John Morgan. We are in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, Holland, whatever you want to call it. We're going with the Netherlands this week is apparently uh, what the Associated Press says you're supposed to do, so that's what we're doing. Unfortunately, there is no cold coffee with me this week. He is staying back home and getting some rest ahead of Curitiba, Brazil, where we will be next week. But in the meantime, we got good things going on here in Rotterdam. It's an MMA Junkie takeover. We've got the whole crew here. Uh, we will be talking to most of them through the night. We're in an Airbnb uh, that we have picked out, which I hear may actually be illegal, is what somebody told me here in Rotterdam. I don't know, but it's not my fault. I didn't know that when I booked it. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm good. With me right now, I think a fantastic place to start in our first ever trip to the Netherlands, Giovanni Chin. Did I get the last name right? Yeah, you did. It's you hard. Did. It's hard. That's not a net. T J I N. It's like it's like chin, like your chin, but only. Okay, there you go. Differently, yeah. Easy. I like it that. Is. All right. Owner, founder, CEO at Epic MMA. Indeed. Owner, founder, CEO at UFC Netherlands. Yeah, Netherlands. It's almost good. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I like that. <laughs> that was nice. That was nice. All right. So first of all, Netherlands, Holland. We don't need a big uh, history lesson here, but what do people here call it? Uh, people here call it the Netherlands. The Netherlands? Nederland. We call it Nederland. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, we d- it's actually just international guys that call us Holland. Unless we're, like, in a soccer or football match, then everybody yells Holland, Holland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know why. Don't okay, know. fair it's enough. It's, it's, not, it's not correct, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> we don't know why. It's not right. It's but not right, it. but it's okay. All right. Well, I think you were the right man to start this podcast off because uh, people may not know, but you were working behind the scenes for a long time to really help the UFC come to Netherlands. I mean, you have been a part – Uh, an integral part uh, of of trying to make this happen. So talk to me about the process and just kind of what you did and and how you've been involved in really helping the UFC come to the Netherlands for the first time. Yeah, well, first of all, it's it's not just me. We're like seven guys and all very passionate guys and like working around the clock, like 24-7, providing all, like I think most of the Dutch UFC fans with the news updates and everything's interviews and stuff. Um, So it's not just me. I just started it and, and... course we've got uh we've got a big team and we're uh yeah we're really enjoying it how it started actually it started out of i know i i, I kind of got annoyed that i could not watch usc live on television so i had to go to you know those those websites where you can stream it all right. with, with crappy quality so didn't want to but just had no had no option no I, I actually tweeted dana white back then like i'm willing to pay just give me the opportunity to watch it but there wasn't any opportunity so um, back then, the UFC had the broadcast deal with Fox, and once that was was announced, I heard Fox was coming to the Netherlands. So uh, what I actually did is contacted Fox and um, just asked them if they were interested, and they were not at first because uh, you know the Netherlands is a big soccer uh, soccer right. country, so it's just soccer and maybe some other sports. And I actually started a, a Facebook page. It was called UFC on Fox and L at first, just to get the UFC broadcasted. On Dutch television. So um, from there, actually, uh, we got massive support from the MMA community. Um, like uh, uh, numerous fighters, like promoted us, shared our profiles, shared a story, and from there, it just took off. And now we're like the biggest, the biggest yeah, media outlet in the Netherlands. And it's still fan base. We're still fans, trying to make a name for ourselves in MMA world right now with Epic MMA, of course. And uh, from there, just meetings with Fox, meetings with uh, the mayor of Amsterdam first, because that was the plan at first, uh, the UFC broadcasted wow. in the Netherlands. And uh, arranged a meeting with uh, the mayor's office of the Netherlands with, uh, I think it was Joe Carr. And sure, yeah. And um, some other uh, UFC guys. And, um, yeah, I don't know, the ball started rolling, and eventually we're here. That's fantastic. Yeah, I man. mean, you really did play an integral role in kind of hooking everybody up. Talk to me first, what the hell took us so long to get here? I mean, anybody that's an MMA fan – knows, you know, the, 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 the Dutch have had a long history in combat sports. Kickboxing, of course, is massive. But, you know, Boss Rutten is an early UFC legend. It seems like fight sport is accepted here and liked here. So what the hell took us so long to get the UFC into the Netherlands? Well, yeah, fight sports, it, it is quite popular here. But, it's, of course, it's, it's kickboxing. Kickboxing was our main thing next to uh, the normal uh, mainstream sports. And, and kickboxing actually really took off with that K1 back in the day. And um, it it kind of how do you call it 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 it, it kind of uh, uh, shit I can't get out of my words like slow down or stagnant yeah or? It, it's, it's like slowed down and um, with the with the K one that stopped actually um, there wasn't very much interest in combat sports plus of course the octagon the cage has always been a struggle here in the Netherlands um, to dive into little history we had 
free fight events back in the days and there was an ex incident with a cage fight and f from that incident and uh, the media got wind of it and, and the, the ministry how to call it the minister of sports and right. recreation i don't know how to, how to what happened call what it was it the incident uh, i think it was just bloody it was too oh, bloody okay. um, it was I, I don't know the specifics happened to be a very it, it was a very very bloody yeah, bloody thing and, and people freaked out yeah and so the the minister back then like actually wrote letters to uh, the, the mayor's offices of all big cities and mma is still legal but it's only legal in the ring but well Which it's not of course it's the ufc is not going to come if they can't use the octagon of course their trademark patented surface they're not gonna come and have a ring no no of course not but it's not really illegal but it's like not really accepted but it's it's starting to roll now because um, after after UC Rotterdam is going to be like a local organization that has like uh, an octagon event, but the rules are different. But it's a start. So so start. how big is MMA right now? I mean, um, the sport itself. I, I was you know I've had a little chance. We haven't been here that long, but you know I had a chance to talk to a couple people, and definitely when they started talking about the USC, I mean they referenced like more of the Dutch kickboxers that are famous. Yeah. But the sport of mixed martial arts right now, it's it's just getting on TV, I guess. How big is it? Is is it accepted here? Is it known here? You said soccer is really the, the the primary sport. I mean, is it is it up there at all? Is it still like infancy stages? What is it? It's it's close to nothing at this time. Um, it's it's just started. It's just started rolling on since the broadcast deal. Um, the 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 viewers are aren't that big. Of course, we have the name. If you have like Conor McGregor or Ronda Rousey on the card, right. of course, people are interested. But for now, it's it's not really big right now. We're actually hoping that this event in Rotterdam will 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 give it a positive boost. So well, it's it's sold out, right? Yeah. So it's sold pretty well. Um, I, I guess that that's a testament to maybe there's some possibilities there, or at least that there's some interest. So uh, I guess first before we talk about that, let's talk about why we're in Rotterdam. You said you, you set up a, you know a meeting with the mayor of Amsterdam. I think probably most people assume the first time we came to the Netherlands, we'd be in Amsterdam. Yeah. Why are we in Rotterdam? Uh, well, uh, actually, the first venue that they uh, wanted to uh, uh, create an event was, uh, I think, was the Ziggo Dome. And it's uh, it's close to a big arena. And the Ziggo Dome uh, said that, no, we do not want to have combat sports here. So they said, okay, they're going to try the arena. So where uh, Ajax, Ajax is like a big, big soccer sure. club. Sure, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and they want to do arena. But um, the, the arena itself, they're like, how do you call it? They they increase the price just because it's UFC and behind the scenes. Like the fee for the arena and everything. Yeah, wow. Fee for the arena. That's what I hear. That's what I hear. Right. And um, and they they like communicated with Sigo Dome and played a political game with that. Ah. So um, but that's uh, that's that's what I hear. Not not officially completely but, unconfirmed. Uh, just yeah, just a couple guys uh, having uh, frosty yeah. beverages. <laughs> we're just talking to MMA. Just Nobody ever listen yeah. to shit. Nobody no, ever no, talking about man. Not. It's all good. <laughs> so so but yeah, I, and I think from that they just look for another place. And Rotterdam is actually it's 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 a it's a big place. It's nice. You can it's, see a it. cool it's a cool I mean, city. I mean, I didn't know much about Rotterdam before I got here. We've had a chance to poke around a little bit. Obviously, we don't get much time for tourism that sort of thing. But from what I understand, uh, obviously a huge, very important port city. Um, that was basically destroyed in World War II. Yeah. So because of that, everything is very new and modern, and they've really embraced it. I mean, the architecture is yeah, very I mean, modern. It's it's very right. cool. I mean, shit, there's people on bikes everywhere. It's a very vibrant kind of city. Sure. Um, seems like a, a pretty cool spot. It is. It is. It's a it's a good beginning. You know, um, you know, Amsterdam. It has the name. You know, it's like the last the Las Vegas of of Europe. Right. So everybody would like to go there. But Rotterdam, it's the same country. So same rules. It's not the same. All right. <laughs> no, it seems good. We've been having a good time so far. Okay, so we talked about it. Sold out arena. Uh, so not a big sport. So I'm guessing this is probably all the hardcore fans that, that couldn't wait, that bought tickets and that sort of thing. I mean, what kind of crowd can we expect in there on Sunday night? Are we going to get a rowdy crowd? Are we going to get a knowledgeable crowd? Is it people that don't know, but it's just the spectacle and they want to come figure it out? What, what yeah, are we going to see? I think it's a combination of that. I think Probably, of course, we, we all know the stand-up game. We all know stand-up fighting. So um, what I'm worried about, if if a fight goes to the ground, if the fans or if the, at least the people in the arena could, like, appreciate it, right. like, I don't know what to expect because it's, the, it's our first event. And most of the time when, when Dutch crowds all there and all combined, they're, like, chanting and singing and doing all crazy stuff. But I don't know. I don't know how they're going to react. Plus, I don't really know if this is going to be all Dutch people. Mm. Because I think personally, 
maybe 70 percent is dutch and the rest is all tourists yeah. flying over from everywhere like from germany uh, make a little holiday out of yeah, it yeah, see sure, the event. sure sure makes and, sense and it's a sunday event so they can party on friday and uh, weigh in on saturday and uh, sunday and uc event and they go home with a hangover <laughs> nice all right well, today was uh, uh basically it was an empty day on the schedule now the, the the crew here at mma junkie we actually did some interviews we did some uh some some radio ah, it's okay it's the road show baby you can talk come on in we got our crowd rolling in from the street <laughs> Abby Subban, brand new videographer, uh, yeah. staff member, is uh, carrying sacks full of frosty beverages. Now McGrath is here. He's got God knows what in those uh, <laughs> things that he's carrying over there. We'll talk to him in a little bit. Uh, Giovanni, so uh, so today there wasn't much going on. We, we kind of made up some stuff, and, and we did some uh, some interviews, and, and we got some media. But I, we haven't seen an actual media event. Tomorrow we will. Yeah. What kind of media turnout do you think we're going to see? Let's talk size. I mean, how many people we think we're going to see, and are we going to see – like mainstream broadcast, uh, t- you know, television, th- I mean, local media. W- what kind of media do you think we're going to see both in terms of size and, and scope? Well, I think that we're going to see a lot of media, uh, probably mainstream media, but because of the simple reason, uh, a lot of people applied for credentials, and not on, not just us, but like um, people from all around Europe, and right. some of them got got their credentials denied. Okay. So, and that, of course, because of there were so many – yeah, that uh, says so something. When they're not, so, yeah. they, you know, they don't. The USC does have a very. I mean, basically, what they do is they look at the credentials they have, the applications, and they only have a certain number of space to give away. And once they reach that limit, they kind of look at uh, basically like the the size of your vin- of your uh, sure. your your media outlet, how yeah. much traffic you're getting. But I have seen some shows where there's people that I know wouldn't normally get into a show, but because they don't have enough media credential applications, they're just like, yeah, come on yeah, in. No, so if they're I, turning people down, yeah, so it's probably going to be good. I know that. Um, like Fox, like the Dutch Fox is um, actually doing a pre-fight show where they have like celebrities and, and oh, people wow. that are uh, sort of into MMA. Some people are very into MMA. Uh, like Probably Rico Verhoeven is going to be in the pre-fight show as well. And um, they're, they're really trying to to, uh, uh, to reach out to the new fans and reach out to uh, the people that, that do not know the sport yet. So I think we're going to be going to see some mainstream media, big newspapers, and of course international. Very cool. So yeah. what do you think the long-term plan is? I mean, obviously Europe's tough. I mean, to you guys in Europe only get a handful of events a year anyway, you know, maybe 4 to 6 or whatever, and 6 would be amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? But they've talked about it and and I feel like they're moving in the right direction, but there's so many damn markets to get to within Europe. So I mean, what do you think for the time being? I mean, this has been a financial success. There's no doubt about it. If the fights are good and the coverage is good, I'm sure the USC will want to come back. I'm sure they'll want to do Amsterdam. Yeah. Is this the type of market that can do one event a year, or is this going to be one of those places that's every two or three years, something along those lines? It depends on the card. Because we, we, now we have like a real steady card. And not to talk about bad about the about the London card, because um, from my opinion, um, the the main event was the the biggest fight, so to say. Sure. You know, and if you look at this car, you know, it's, it's, it's all beasts. And right. it's, I don't know, I, I think they put special attention and, of course, all strikers are on this card. And I think right. with the media attention and with this venue being sold out this quick, I think they, they, they have to come here. And, well, you know, Alistair Overeem has been promised a title shot if he wins. So if he wins, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. But <laughs> wishful thinking. You don't think he's going to win or do you no, think no, he's no, going to no, get no, a title no, shot? No, no, no. I, I don't. Th- I don't think he's going to get the title shot. And the reason why, well, he could get the title shot, but only if he wins in impressive fashion. Right. Because we o- we have Kane waiting, you know. So you never know what happens. But what I so you're not giving Travis Brown much love then? I don't know. Probably. <laughs> yeah, why, man? Why? No, <laughs> no. Okay, but no. But the, um, how do you, how do you, how do you say it? I see what you're saying. It's it's. I mean, he's it got depends. a nice little win streak. Yeah. But you're right. There's a lot going on it's right there. There's a lot going on. Top. And. Well, what I what I'm trying to say is that if he wins from uh, f- from uh, against Arlovsky, then we might get. I hope that we might get a title fight here mm-hmm. in the arena. I don't. And that's what I, I did. I, I did hear, it's funny. I did hear that uh, there will be representatives from the Amsterdam arena here, of course, visiting as they should. And I, and, I, and I think I think honestly, you know, it's easy to take a stand to take like a moral stand or whatever. Yeah. But then if like that's your business and you show up and you're like. 
why the hell are all these? I mean, look at this packed place, and yeah. look how much alcohol is being sold, and look how much merchandise is being sold. Yeah. Look how much money is being spent. Look how many hotel rooms are being. Their hands. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. yeah then you course. start going. You know, maybe we don't have yeah. such a problem with cage yeah. fighting <laughs> after all. Like, <laughs> probably. It's, yeah. It's okay. So. Um, how important is it for the Dutch fighters to to get wins here? In, in order for it to grow, I mean, you know, there are some markets where it's like they only cheer for their own. Then there's other people that just like sports. I mean, of course, I'm sure you don't want every Dutch fighter to lose, but no. for this thing to be successful, is it imperative that the Dutch fighters win or is this more of a culture that's just like embrace the sport no, I, I do think so uh, to, to to talk about another sport like darts we, uh, we have like good yeah i know i know i thought you Easy. said a sport no 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 no, no. <laughs> yeah my man simon yeah simon just shook my head uh, just shook my head so yeah yeah a sport darts sport like so dutch people weren't really interested in darts but once we had like a dutch champion like everybody went on board it was right. crazy so that's why i'm hoping for Alistair, not just only for him, but for the sport in general. And he for is acceptance. pretty famous here, though, right? I yeah, mean, he yeah. is, of course, before, um, because of his uh, K1 days. Mm. So that's why, um, not to take anything away from Olofsky, but that's why I want Alistair, Alistair to win. Sure. Just because it will give the, the sport such a boost here. And if he wins, like, impressively, it will be in all newspapers. We're going to get a lot of new fans. And... Uh, you never know. Maybe, maybe he wins the title. How excited are you? I mean, knowing the effort that you put in, the groundwork that you and your yeah. team laid. I mean, is there a part of you that feels like a little sense of pride that, like, holy shit, this is all yeah, finally sure, happening? Yeah, sure, sure. But the funny thing, actually, is um, the international media is giving us attention for that. But in the Netherlands itself, not really, because I, I, I don't think – I think because the sport isn't that big yet. Of course, it's a sense of pride, and we're, re we're really working really hard on this. And um, – yeah, I think if I'm there in Rotterdam and I'm sitting there and I'm like enjoying the enjoying like the the the, the environment and everything, yeah, I'm gonna feel a little a little proud. That's I, awesome. I, I won't cry. Maybe a little from the inside. <laughs> That's maybe, awesome. Maybe yeah. Well, we know uh, what's happening here in Rotterdam. Help us. Are Are there any? Since you cover the, the the Dutch scene so so tight, help us. Are there are there any prospects like names that we need to be looking out for? Maybe you know guys that are on the cusp or girls that are on the cusp of being in the UFC, or maybe some people you know that are signing with Bellator World Series. I mean, are there any names coming up through the system that we need to be looking out for? Yeah, well, actually, because of the sport is the sport is this young, there's not really a lot of big names to 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 you know to keep an eye on but we have like Jamil Chan this up and coming guy uh, he's fought in Bellator in his first fight won impressively and uh, of course and we got Rico Verhoeven he's switching over to MMA uh, Denise Kielholz I don't know I if didn't you know. know he was switching over he already had a fight I didn't know that yeah he already yeah. Fight. He won yeah he was a Dutch grappling champion once yeah. so he, he does know some grappling and um, yeah man we got we got some. That's like an ultimate fighter guy who uh, who applied and he, he didn't win, but um, he was uh, like uh, on the cast, you know. Right. Paulo Boot is called, and uh, he might he might uh, break through. We have Peter Buist. That's a guy who might break through as well. We have some 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 good names. Yeah, I heard Andy Sauer is doing MMA as well. You know Andy Sauer. Sure. You know. Yeah. So he's he's been training with Jose Aldo, preparing him for the fights against McGregor. Oh yeah, right, right. And he's now um, doing. Uh, doing MMA as well, tr trying to establish a team here. So, so it's all looking good. So uh, the stars are aligning. But now it's it's just it's all it all depends on this event, how this will be in the media if it's accepted, if it's accepted and stuff. So yeah, I don't know, man. That's awesome. I man. really well, hope it's a, so. it's a big night, man. It's cool yeah. to see. Uh, obviously, I remember uh, the days when you were just kind of starting this whole campaign, yeah. and now we're here. It feels like we've come a long way, man. So sure. so very very cool. Uh, any last messages that you want to get out and let people know where they can find all your work, Twitter, Instagram, whatever you want to plug, social media, your website. Plug everything and say wow. anything you want. The floor is yours, my friend. How, how many minutes do I have? As long as you want, bro. As no, long no, as you no. want. It's, We're it's, on the internet, it's baby. Lot. It's good. It's not, it's not a lot. Uh, first of <laughs> all, it's our, it's our website. You know, um, like UC Netherlands, it's, it's a Facebook page, and it's still – fan based we're still learning like the whole craft of journalism we're still fans you know it's it's it's, it's sometimes it's hard for us to act appropriately because we're actually really <laughs> fans but but you you're know, trying that's what we're, we're trying we're trying we're getting there slowly but surely but um yeah so UFC Netherlands um you can find us on Twitter that's at UFC underscore Nederland oh it's gonna be hard because <laughs> we, we, we write it in Dutch so um, but you can probably find it. And uh, the most important thing, of course, is our website. That's Epic MMA. It's just an ad and Epic MMA all attached. You might have seen us with the Fader interview when he challenged Fabricio for Doom. And uh, we, we also 
we did we had some successes like the first time like McGregor was uh, like Aldo was uh, injured mm-hmm. we broke the news back then so that was cool but we were just how did you break that uh, sources. Okay. Oh, sources. I like my man. I'm, I'm, See, I'm you are learning journalism, getting, man. Getting, Look at you. I'm getting there. I'm getting like, there. I'm like, I'm not giving up my sources. Yeah, we're you talking jackass. off air. We're off air. We're talking <laughs> off air. So, um, yeah, Epic MMA on Twitter. You can follow me. It's just uh, G underscore Chin. It's just G underscore T J I N. And, um, yeah, we'll see from there. You can follow me and uh, follow the journey into professional journalism. That's what's up, man. <laughs> awesome, brother. Well, thank you so much for sitting down. We uh, Now that our whole crew has made it in, we started out with kind of a light crew. Everybody has made it back from the frosty beverage journey. We are now restocked on beverages for the rest of the night, so we're going to re-up on those. Oh, yeah. While we do that uh, – Everybody check out a conversation I had with my man John Tuck earlier this afternoon. He's a guy that uh, I've just happened to be a part of his, his UFC journey. Uh, he, four of his six UFC fights have been international. Of course, I travel quite a bit, so uh, we've uh, struck up a little bit of a relationship and uh, thought I would catch up with him. So while we re-up on these frosty beverages, here's John Tuck and uh, Giovanni, man. Appreciate it. You're welcome, man. Anytime. <laughs> Mr. John Tuck, good to see you, my man. It's been a long time since we've seen you in action. For those that don't know, I've seen you along the way, but where have you been for the last year? Well, I was, I've been in Guam. Well, actually, I've been, I've been recovering from shoulder surgery and got cleared uh, around November, December to, to full, full throttle training. And, um, yeah, I started training hard since January. I was trying to get on the Australia card in March. Didn't go through, so I was already in, in, you know phenomenal shape and wanted to turn it up more because they placed me on the rotterdam card which is this sunday and so i headed out to train um in orange county with uh king's mma and church boys and my conditioning coach nick kerson over at uh, speed of sport we thought about you a long time training at the lab. So now that you're out there in Southern California, first of all, what brought you to that area? And, and, and what are you thinking about the scene right now? It sounds like there's a lot of good stuff going on in SoCal right now. Yeah, well, you know, I really wanted to take my conditioning to another level. Uh, I just wanted, you know, he, Nick Kerson and Speed of Sport, he, he's really got a, a different um, a different way to, to train his athletes, you know, and and it's you know he doesn't deal with so much weight but more focus on speed and and explosive strength and you know that's the kind of that's kind of what i need in my arsenal is just to make sure that i'm faster than everybody and and just as strong and powerful because you know with speed you can you can come with uh knockouts easier you know so i uh, really worked with him and then also uh kings and church boys you know they got they got all the top guys Verdum, Dos Anjos, Machida, and Jake Ellenberger, and Kelvin Gastelum, and great kickboxers, you know, Giga Chikadze, and uh, Artur, and there's many, many, many guys that that are not even known that, that will be one day. That's awesome. Now you're fighting here, uh, international event for you again. I think it's your fourth international event out of your six UFC fights. I know you wanted to fight in Asia, but, I, I mean, are you, have you told them, like, don't put me on these United States cards. Let's let me go see the world. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't mind fighting on big, bigger, uh, bigger cards in in U.S. You know, or I, I like to, I like to go to the the unknown territory. You know, if I could, but uh, I love I love being in Asia because you know I bring a whole a whole wolf pack with me from Guam. You know, I was trying to I was trying to fight in that Australia card, and maybe five hundred to a thousand would would have flown out to watch that fight. So imagine if they go back to the Philippines or Japan or, or wherever it be in Asia, for sure I'm going to have at least a 1,000 people. You know, the governor of Guam, the lieutenant governor of Guam, they'll fly out too. So so it's really, uh, I got I got that whole support system. When I fight far away uh, as as I am here, you know, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of supporters that will fly out, but, you know, I'm packing an army when, when, when I'm closer to Asia Pacific region. Nice. Well, I heard the Philippines in November, so I guess we can pencil you in for that card right now. We'll just get that done. Yeah, man. S- sign me up. You know, reserve a spot for me, you know. I mean, sh- if you want, you know, hopefully I get a couple more wins to, to maybe co-main event that thing or even main event if somebody falls out. Nice. I'm willing for the task, you know. Five rounds, no problem. Nice. Well, let's talk about this fight first up that you have. I'm assuming you got on a plane thinking you were fighting Nick Hine. Uh, when did you find out that that wasn't going down, and how did it play out for, for you to get this replacement fight? 
Well, yeah, it sucks, man, because, you know, you, you train you train a whole camp for some guy that you put your mind into. But, you know, I'm sparring with everybody, high-level guys, you know, whether it be stand-up or, or wrestling or whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm training with the best. And um, the guy, you know, I woke up, what was it, like three days ago or something. I woke up and I seen, I seen, uh, I seen the fact that Nick Hine was injured. I was like, damn, really? You know, I was like, I trained the whole time for that, but I just had to switch, uh, switch my my mind to focus it on now and Josh Emmett. You know, um, the only thing is fighting a southpaw to an orthodox guy. But uh, yeah, it, it's you know, I let it go. You know, people do get injured and. And uh, wish Nick Hine the best, you know, recover well. And, you know, one day we can meet up again. And, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. It's a beautiful country. And to put it all on the line for, for everybody that supports me on my island, you know. So how does that process go, though? I mean, does Joe Silva call you and say, hey, we're thinking about this guy? Or do you basically just find out I'm fighting somebody new and you don't really have much say in the matter? Well, my manager um, actually hit me up. He said, hey, what? what's going on he your opponent pulled out uh joseph hit him up and and they just told me who the opponent was and i was like hey man I was, i'll scrap anybody it doesn't matter you know things happen and you gotta adjust you know what if nick Hine wasn't uh southpaw and i had to fight him orthodox you know that that could have been different it's like when i fought the chinese guy uh chia transang uh, i trained for a uh, regular stance guy but he came out southpaw but you know, it doesn't matter. A scrap's going to be a scrap, and I train hard, and I train with with so many different kind of kind of styles that it's not even going to play a big big difference. You know. Nice. Well, I think a lot of people. It's been so long. Might forget. You had a great performance last time out. Picked up a bonus. It's been a year. How big is this fight now to kind of get that momentum going? Because you've never won two UFC fights in a row. You know, to, to get that win streak going, and also to kind of pick back up where you left off a year ago. Yeah, I mean, you know, winning coming off of that coming off that fight. And, and planting the seed that, that I am uh, an exciting fighter, you know. I mean, I, I perform well in the other fights, but not where I should have performed, you know. But in that last fight, that's where I felt like I, I, I showed somewhat more of a taste of what I, what I have to offer. And, and I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to riding a five-fight winning streak, you know, and just keep climbing the ranks and, and get up to contendership because that's, you know, that's really what, where I should be. And I mean, I train with the best, and and you know, it's it's if not the same, or just you know, you know, just right there, you know. So it's like I'm just ready to take this all 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 the way to the top, and and get in there, and finally, and finally, you know, truly represent. Nice. You mentioned Guam quite a bit. What's the scene like there, man? I mean, obviously you're representing the island, but what, what, what's it like there? I've never been. Yeah, well, Guam is kind of more like um, a smaller version of Hawaii. If you could say it'd be the Hawaii for Asia. Uh, it's real like, it's not as crowded as Hawaii. It's, it's way beautiful. And, uh, I, you know, I come from an exotic place. It's a beautiful island, man. Everybody's so loving and giving and, you know, people are really proud and respectful of uh of our heritage and yeah the scene over there is is awesome i mean it's like training in paradise you know and everybody everybody grows up training you know jiu-jitsu is real big mma is big you know it's like if not soccer or, or real one of the regular sports mma or jiu-jitsu is like the biggest sport on the island per capita in the world we are we train most people in the world train in jiu-jitsu and mma on guam it's a lot of up-and-comers you know got a lot of guys coming from from uh, the gym we train at, and and uh, they they should be in the in in the UFC if not you know sooner, but they'll eventually get there. Very nice. You represent Guam with the with the necklace you wear, weigh-ins, right? Can you tell people about that? What, what it represents and what it means to you? Well, the the sanahi is what I wear. It's uh, it's made from a a giant clamshell, and uh, since way back um, before Christ, you know those days my people would dive in the ocean and and pick up these giant clamshells and pick it back up and take it onto the beach and then you know the process of of carving it down into that crescent shape that that it is and it's more for like a, a ceremonial or very important events but also the chiefs wear it and 
mine's actually a real big one so you know uh -huh, i'm proud of proud to to represent you know that that uh, every time i go into the ring or into the, the octagon it's it's uh you know that's 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 for for the pride of my people very cool if i remember right i think it might have been uh when we were in Macau, I think it broke one time, right? So do you take extra care with it now when you're packing it up and putting it in the luggage? <laughs> no, that was actually in New Mexico, man. Uh, Big John, um, he he uh, was handling it and he put it in the uh, in the gi and and he placed it down. But that thing is like it's it's fragile, you know. You got to take care of it, even though it weighs like like two pounds or three pounds, you know. He put it down and that thing just snapped in half. But I ended up getting an, a new one, and uh, I saved the other one, you know, put put it together and everything. But um, but yeah, no, you, you got to really take care of that thing because it's you gotta gotta respect it. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. All right, well, let's talk about Sunday night. What are we gonna see? You mentioned you know the focus is is on speed and you know a new type of training. It's been a while since we've seen you in action. So what kind of fight are we gonna see on Sunday? Well, you know, man, I didn't like I've said, I'm only, I'm only, it's, I'm not even. I'm not even near where I should be, and I have so much potential. And and all these, all the coaching I've got from from Nick Kirsten and Rafael, uh, Master Rafael Cordero and and Jacob Harmon, you know, it's like uh, I still have so much potential, so much time to grow and room to grow. And but I think this is the best I've ever been. As at the same time, I'm more 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 faster, stronger, and and. Um, I'm just I'm just excited, man. It's gonna be a whole different beast, you know. Super Saiyan level two, Super Saiyan level three, whatever, man. I'm 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 just pumped to to get in there and and actually showcase this time, you know. I mean, coming off that that last win, you know, it's uh, it's exciting to to finally really take flight and take take uh take what's truly mine. And and I sacrificed so much, you know. I left family to be where I'm at, and and uh you know. The sacrifice there is, is going to help me get the victory. Welcome back to the MMA Roadshow. That was Mr. John Tuck. Now, a man sitting next to me that needs little introduction. The young Mike Vaughn, he's here. I think I've been hearing all kinds of nicknames being dropped around this week. Abby Savon. Abby Savon gave him word is Bond. I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> the Young Vagabond, you can have that. No, no. <laughs> There's all kinds of opportunities out there. Uh, Mike, give me your early impressions of Rotterdam, man. We haven't been here that long. I think we've been here about uh, 36 hours total at this point. But your early impressions of Rotterdam, what do you think so far? Oh, it's lovely, man. Uh, anytime I get the chance to come to Europe, it's uh, a treat. I mean, it reminds me uh, – I don't even know. It's just it's so beautiful over here. It's hard to compare it to even anything in Canada. There's not really any place like it. It's a unique city, man, for sure. I mean, we were, we were talking to Giovanni earlier kind of a little bit about the history or whatever, but it is kind of a very a very unique city, the fact that it's kind of been built from the ground up in the last 60 years or so. Um, just walking around, the modernistic architecture and stuff like that is it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, man, it's beautiful. I, yeah, I just feel privileged to be here. It's uh, such an honor we get to do this job and come to places like this. And, <laughs> you know, we haven't even really gotten started with the true work week yet. We still got really tons of fun stuff coming up. So you can't ask we're for much more out of life. Just getting started with the frosty beverages as well. And that's really the important part. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We were, when we were arriving here, um, I know you, we, you and I both did the same thing. We flew into Amsterdam. It was the easier journey. I, I got lucky and actually um, ran into somebody I knew at the airport and I jumped into a car with him. Um, you took the train up here, which was very simple as well, about yeah. a half hour by, by, by train. Yeah, super short. You know, it's funny, kind of gauging the interest. I ran to Alistair over him at the airport. Um, he was getting his bags. Nobody accosted him. I know he's pretty famous here, but nobody bothered him. So, you know, I don't think he's like, you know, I don't know, Justin Bieber or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, people kind of left him alone. Which is interesting because it's like it's not like he's this person that just, like, fits in. Right. You know, he's well, a here very he noticeable does. There's so many dude. damn like, big people everywhere. He's not <laughs> – Yeah, but still, even then, he, like, stands out pretty pretty good. Yeah, they kind of left him alone. But it was funny. We did – in the car on the way here, it was about an hour by car. So we were driving, and the driver uh, – inevitably, there was three of us in the car actually together. It was kind of asking us what we all do. And uh, the other two people are both involved in this event in different ways as well. And we were kind of talking about it. And uh, there were three people, three people 
that this driver asked me about. And I wish I had had my phone out and I was recording it. I was so pissed off because sometimes I'll just record random like MMA conversations sure, I'm having yeah. with people. But I feel kind of like a dick about it because like yeah. the dude's like trying to be nice and then you're like going to put him on blast on the road show or whatever. <laughs> right. you know? I didn't want to do that. But there were three people that he asked me about. You want, you want to guess at, at, at any of them? Uh, Ronda Rousey? Missed. Believe it or not. Shocking. No. The first one was that Irish kid. Okay, it's Con- well, Conor McGregor. Yeah, Conor McGregor. I was sure either going to say gonna Ronda Rousey or Conor McGregor. Conor first. was going to be your second guess for sure. It's that Irish kid, and that's what I say. You know, when people uh, talk to me about like who's the biggest star in the sport, um, definitely, I think for the longest time, Ronda was. Yeah, Conor's definitely I, overtaken I, her at this point. I think so, sure. and people, are, and again, people don't necessarily know, but everywhere I go, they either don't know shit about MMA or they say, "What about that Irish kid?" Right. They don't. They might not even know his name. Now, the second one, Bruce Buffer. Okay, well, you could have given me a hundred guesses, and I would have never said Bruce that. Buffer, what, what did this man Bruce ask Buffer, about? Just Bruce you know, Buffer. is Bruce gonna be here? I'm like, yes, Bruce is gonna be here. Like, he's the biggest star. I'm like, yes, he is one of the biggest stars. So Bruce Buffer was asked about, and, and the third, three, Dana White, Kimbo Slice. Oh God, of Kimbo course. Slice. Yep. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, all right, you mentioned it, uh, Bruce Buffer. I just don't see that, that Irish that kid, looks. Bruce Buffer, and Kimbo Slice. Your three biggest stars. No offense, in the Bruce. I love you, but based on my uh, based on my deep research of one person, those are the three biggest stars in MMA in the Netherlands. Right on. Uh, you can't argue with data like that. Fucking good for Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all, that's all I can say. He's Kimbo status. He's Kimbo Conor McGregor. Uh, Please tell him that because he will love it. That would be a hell of a, a hell of a group hanging out. Can you imagine Conor McGregor, Bruce Buffer, and Kimbo Slice just like kicking it at a bar? And you know what? Bruce would probably have the hottest ladies around him. No question. Just because he's, just, just he's Bruce. No question. No question. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned it today that the official media activities haven't really gotten underway, but we, uh, but we did put in some work today on the MMA Junkie team. Uh, Abby Subban was, of course, shooting, and you were uh, you were doing uh, your interview action. Uh, so, we, so we put you on camera a lot today, man, and, and uh, gave you a little love there. All those videos are up now at MMA Junkie, so people should be able to see those. But um, I guess, you know, you've made it clear that's kind of something you want to do more of. When you're at an event, you would like to do more on-camera stuff and, and, and kind of start chasing that path down your career as well. So just kind of talk about, you know, what, what you enjoy about it, why you like to do, and kind of where you, where you see yourself going. I mean, you, we, we, we hired you onto this team as a young kid. You're growing up in the sport. You're, you're growing up in the industry. And talk about kind of where it is you want to go. Yeah, and I guess just for the reason I like doing the on-camera stuff is because when I first got into MMA, you know, it was you follow it online. And I remember I'd watch our buddy Showdown Joe's interviews. It would always be at sure. the events. There would be, you know, a handful of people. Uh, Ariel Hawani would be one of them that would do the on-camera interviews. And this was before MMA Junkie ever did any video of any sort. Right. Uh, I, of course, read the site and, you know, read those stories. But other things, you'd seek out video. And we didn't have it for a long time. Yeah. And I just uh, – that's what really got me into it. I found that you connect a lot more with the athletes when it's – an interviewer that's you know engaging good at all that stuff is talking to the fighter i just feel like it brings out more than just sticking a camera on someone's face and that works in some some like a lot of situations but if you have the time if you're able to do it and you know you have a competent person that's something i think really enhances the enjoyment of watching an interview so that's always something you know i found and i believe even when we started video i kind of preached that from day one and gave my input and i know you know people like to do certain things certain ways but uh, it's awesome to me that we're kind of opening up and you know trying new things and giving me the ability to try that and of course uh you know like you said i'm you guys hired me young, and I'm still young. It's my 25th birthday in a couple of weeks coming up on May 21st. Oh, nice. So, nice. Happy birthday. Uh, you know, still young in the game, and, of course, I feel like I have a long way to go. Uh, you know me pretty well. I'm, you know, kind of a perfectionist. I don't, feel, you know, ever settle with anything, and that won't be the case here. So I do hope people enjoy it and know that they're always going to get better. And I just find it's, like, inter- it's more enjoyable interacting with the fighters that way, too, and you're kind of a lot closer to them and try to make it more of a conversation than just – I feel like sometimes they can get uncomfortable when you're just sticking a camera in their face. Sure. And if you interview a person the right way, they'll probably forget the camera's even there. Right. And that's, like, the ideal goal. And maybe they'll open up more and say certain things certain ways. So uh, that's kind of – and I saw that from people like Showdown Joe, who I thought was amazing, and you know, other people out there who are really good interviews, even other sports too. I just found that was a great way to do it. So, yep, very cool, uh, you know, I hope people enjoy what I'm doing too. And as I said, going to get better. And it was really fun doing them. some of them today. We got some good, some really good stuff. We did indeed. So all those are on MMA Junkie now. You can check those out. We'll probably have a few more tomorrow. Now it'll be, it'll be a media day tomorrow. So it'll be a little bit more of a scrum yeah, a uh, type hectic. setting. But yeah. we'll have to see 
how that works. If you play your cards right, sometimes you can still kind of sneak in a one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. but you're not really guaranteed one. Yeah. So we'll have to feel it out, man. If it's loaded, then we just get yeah. what we get. If there's Absolutely. some little spaces in time, then we'll do it. So, yeah, of course. Uh, all right, let's talk about this card real quick. I mean, the MMA Roadshow is not a uh, breakdown type of a show. It's more sure. about just having some frosty beverages and talking about the experiences. But I know, uh, you know, at, at, at your core, you're like me. You're an MMA fan. You know yep. what I mean? Of course, this is our job, but at, at the end of the day, we're still fans inside. And I know um, – when I get on a plane and I'm I'm looking at a card, that, you know, there's certain fights. But yeah, I'm looking I'm looking more forward to. You know, yeah. it's like, dude, that's the one that's really piqued my interest a little bit. Um, I, you know, I just kind of want to get a feel for you. What's something that's sticking out on this card? Sure, we know the main event should be fun with Andre Arlovski, yeah. Alistair Overeem. Even the co-main event, no, Antonio Silva, Stefan Struve. It's definitely Tumanov and Garen Nelson. Got it right. That's a, yeah, that's a that's fun the one. fight, man. And you know, we've been you were with me when we first met Albert Tumanov back in Sweden, and he, you know, gave us that golden line: "I'm the best striker in MMA." And you know, I kind of every time he fights, I tweet out that interview, even though it's from like you know two <laughs> years ago, just because I want to remind him. And then he goes out and wrecks someone with the striking. So, uh, you know, he's a joy to watch. And if you look at this fight, I mean. If there's anyone out there who still thinks like winner versus winner and loser versus loser matchmaking is a thing, like no, it's not a thing. Look at Tumanov, he's on a five fight winning streak. Gary Nelson just got owned yeah. badly, like 30 26 rounds from Damian Maya. So, like, that just shows that that's no longer a way Sean Shelby and Joe Silva do things, even on like a level where those guys are like top 20, you know. Uh, so I find that interesting. It's just, of course, an intriguing style matchup. We've seen Nelson or uh, Tumov last fight. He went out there, fought Lorenz Larkin, who's a guy who was more than willing to stand and trade with him. Yep. And that, that was a pretty close fight. I mean, he ate a lot of leg kicks. But, you know, this is a completely different style from that. We know Gar Nelson, even though he got completely dominated by Damian Maia in the grappling, he's still an excellent, phenomenal grappler. Going to be better than like 90% of the dudes in the division. So uh, it'll be interesting. Tumanov's shown really good takedown defense. I think it's like the fourth best in the division or something. So I, I think Gar Nelson, you know, if he can take him down, really curious to see that part of Tumanov's game. It's just a good style matchup and it's going to be a good fight. And, you know, Tumanov wins. It's probably going to be uh, something vicious, vicious as usual. And if Nelson wins, it'll probably be something slick and exciting. So I see this fight one way or the other, you know, being a pretty good finish or maybe it's like really competitive. And, you know, Gar Nelson, his striking's underrated, man. Like he, he, he decked Brandon Thatch before he choked him out with that punch. True. I know Thatch has been on a bit of a skid since, but like that's still impressive. That's an impressive he's, one. Still, he's still a beast of a striker. So uh, for Nelson to do that, like definitely don't count out his striking. I think it's, he's not going to be like going in there diving for legs, like flopping around in the octagon and stuff. He's going to try to. You know, he's going to be able to get his takedowns a little more methodically and work his way in. So that's I'm pumped gonna be up. I think fight. that's definitely the one that stands yeah, out. And, and I think fight. you're right. It is, it is very much – I mean, even though this is mixed martial arts and everybody's well-rounded and everybody's got skills, I mean, I think you wouldn't pick Gunnar Nelson to win a stand-up battle and you wouldn't pick Albert Tumanoff to win a, a grappling match over the course of 15 minutes. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's like whichever not. guy can impose their will. But yeah. that's a relevant fight, man, between two very talented fighters, and and I'm, I'm with you on that one. I think that's the one. So, all right. Uh, well, of course, you are uh, a Canadian, the young Mike Vaughn is, and – just want to get your insight, man. What the hell's going on up there with your with your with your Canadian market, man? I know you guys got Ottawa coming up. Yep, pretty which soon. is actually a really good card too. Yeah, good card. It good is card. a good card. Some good fights on there. But I was hoping maybe you could give me some insight. I I, talk, I try to talk to Tom Wright every time I see him. Dude, Tom, Tom Wright, he is the, the king of the non-answer. The king the of the non-answer. And that, and that, that man is from, a corporate dude, vault. He was the commissioner of the CFL for however many years, like eight, ten years, eight years or something. So like he knows he's dealt with every type of controversy, uh, every media outlet, you know, teams leaving cities, like teams getting shut down. He's dealt with tons of stuff. So, you know, there's no answer or question you can ask him that he's, like, not going to be able to work his way around. So he's and he very, won't be rude. He'll be very polite. Yeah, oh, he will. He'll give you the most professional answer. And you're like, it's like you're sitting there and you're talking to him. You're like, yeah, yeah thanks, Tom. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, he makes and then you, you go back and listen to your tape and you're like, he didn't actually say anything. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, I, he's I have the nothing king. I can write right now. Yeah, and and he knows it too. Like, and you interview him, and I still interview him for the sake of it, because like maybe he'll, but he's not going to give you anything until the UFC announces it. Right. And of course, the UFC Canada office, I think, is like four people, five people, right. or something. It's very small, so like very few things are going to leak out of there. And I know everything works through Vegas and stuff, but uh, you know, if it's something specific they're working on, I'm sure it's you know it's pretty close lip. But still, like back to your point. Uh, you know, the, every year they go into the year, you talk to Tom, three to four events this year, like they say the exact same thing. And I think, you know, last year was the first year yes, in Canadian, like since they first came to uh, Canada, however many years ago, 
there's been like less than or two shows or less. Yeah. There's been three like over the past few years. So I guess they've lived up to it. But like, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just weird because obviously the GSP thing, like he's gone. Uh, Roy McDonald's gonna headlight that fight against Stephen Thompson, which is like probably one of my favorite fights coming Great up fight. on the entire schedule. Awesome. And tickets for that event sold out. So it's, you know, everyone says like the Canadian market, this and that, but it's like any other place, you know, as one of the guys was saying earlier, when you said, are they going to come back to like Netherlands? How often is it going to be? It's all about the card. It's all about the card and the main event. Like, you know, the, they go certain places. It's just not going to work. Like you need to build cards certain way. And if you do it, tickets are going to come. You can't put Demetrius Johnson versus Kyoji Horiguchi in Montreal where they did GSP fights over and over. Like, dude, it was shocking sitting in that arena for that Demetrius Johnson fight, especially after being there. I think one of my first ever UFC events was the Condit GSP fight. And, like, that thing was... Even then, that was, like, you know, a little... After GSP had headlined there, like, five times. So it wasn't ap at its absolute peak, but it was still, like, 19,000 people. It was insane. And then to go in there, when Demetrius Johnson's fighting, nothing against him. Like, we just know he is who he is, and his ability to draw is what it is. But, like, they had the entire upper deck completely taped off. The bottom wasn't even filled. Like, you hear how many tickets they gave away, like, thousands. Any You saw the amount of, like... We see every event, you know, meet Dana White here, blah, blah. But this was just, like, crazy. It was everywhere all the week. So, uh, yeah, it's just we don't have, like, the, enough stars, really. And I think even more to the point about the fighters, like, guys coming up, I think a lot, like, at least a, 10 of those fights on the Ottawa card have Canadians in them. But right. if you look over the history of the past fights, I think like, Canadians are, like, you know, like 4 and 10 or 4 and 11 in their last 15 UFC fights Jeez. or something. So it's not like they're, you know, out there dominating. And that's also a problem. So you need guys winning. You need stars coming. So, so if Rory ends up going to Bellator, man, who knows? That'd be scary. very interesting. But like they keep saying, you know, there's gonna be shows there. And like I said, like they've done shows all over Canada that haven't had the Canadian star. Like they've done shows in Vancouver. You know, Chuck Liddell, Rich Franklin. They've done stuff in Toronto. John Jones has headlined there multiple times. It's all about the fight. Like Canadian fans, to their core, are just fight fans. You know, right. like most of us. If you give them a good card. You can do it, and it's not like – I think it also an issue is is the dollar right now too. Sure. Because it's, uh, you know, I don't One know. One of its weakest points ever, right? Yep, exactly. So that definitely, I'm sure, has something to do with it, with logistics and, you know, how the UFC operates and, you know, paying the athletes and all this stuff. A lot of stuff people would never think about or really talk about when they just say, you know, UFC is screwing Canada. Right. There's a lot of things that go into it. So I think, you know – they're going to keep coming back. They're not going to give up. They're going to do shows here and there. I, I believe there'll be a pay-per-view somewhere later this year. Probably one of like the major cities, uh, you know, Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, probably not Montreal. I think Montreal has ruled itself out for a little bit, but they can still do sh big shows there. So I, I don't think it's like as dreadful as it could be, but it's just about, you know, fighters winning their fights and putting on the right cards there like any other market in my mind i don't think it's any you know worse everyone just thinks because it was so good for so long with gsp right but like he was like you know a one of a kind in that sense you're not going to get another draw like him so let's talk pound for pound best fighter in mixed martial arts to peel back the curtain a little bit in our rankings uh we kind of have this email thread where we talk about rankings george garcia gorgeous george from made junkie radio he kind of heads up the rankings committee he kind of lays out his guidelines, and then he's like, here's what I think. Open it up for feedback. What do you think? The most spirited debate I've ever seen in mixed <laughs> yeah. martial arts uh, well, at MMA Junkie history was this email thread between all of us. So spirited, in fact, that we ended up making a story out of it. Yeah. <coughs> and it was funny because – <laughs> Stephen Morocco. Which I wasn't asked if my emails could be put in that, by the way. Yeah, all it was, good. it was literally just our emails. Like, it's it's really funny. I, I've had some people that read it and hit me up on Twitter or or actually, like, some people texted me and stuff. I'm like, hey, that was a good debate and stuff like that. And I'm like, I'm like, uh, yeah, it was funny because it was literally just copying and pasting our emails. A few of them. I think it was yeah. actually only mine. I think Ben wrote something oh, did, different. Okay. Yeah. Well, because it was actually my day off, and I think they just. Well, they actually. <laughs> I only had like one little segment because I was busy too. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. actually copied my yeah, email too. So there was a few things, but so, whatever. I didn't say anything in there that I wouldn't, you know, back up. Well, right what here, I was so. gonna say is, I mean, I, I, I had the the argument that it's Demetrius Johnson right now. Uh, I won. Uh, no. <laughs> that, that, luckily, George was on my side as well. So we do currently have Demetrius Johnson ranked number one pound for pound in the MMA Junkie rankings. The most passionate like argument in the other direction was Mike Bond saying, basically, he, he was essentially saying, you guys are all fucking idiots. <laughs> it's John Jones. So now's your chance. Young Mike Bond, you're on the microphone. 
explain to me why I'm a moron for thinking that Demetrius Johnson is the number one pound for pound fighter in mixed martial arts. Okay, I won't be that emphatic and say you're a moron because I would I don't believe you're a moron. I, I think what I said specifically was uh, the UFC rankings, which I think people unanimously agree there is some people on there that they've never even heard of. Right are more accurate than ours, having John Jones in number one, and we are supposed to be a panel of experts. So that was kind of my point there. But still, I just believe, you know... That was passive-aggressive, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Come forward. He's uh, been doing it better for longer, I think. I know Demetrius has been killing it, but, you know, he's fighting guys. Everyone says going into the fight, you know, this guy isn't ready. Like, if only Henry Cejudo had three more fights. Kyoji Horiguchi, I know he backtracked, like, on the week of the fight, but that guy straight up said, like, right before he got offered the title shot, I don't want it for a little while. <laughs> Like, Fair. And of course, before the fight, he's you know gonna say, "I'm ready. I've trained well." But you know, he got completely dominated. Didn't really have any chance. Demetrius is an awesome athlete. He's like probably one of the most well-rounded guys out there. But I just think John Jones. Look at the guys he's been fighting. You know, we have so much revisionist history. Like these guys. You know, everyone says John Jones defended his title against four old guys. Like blah blah blah. Uh, you know, former champions washed up. But like these guys are, f they're that. They're former champions. They've done it at the top of sport. Like. The guys Demetrius is beating have never, some of them have never even fought in number one contenders fight. Some of them, like, I know they got the title shot, but, like, you wouldn't think, like, a guy like John Moraga, who was fighting on the Facebook prelims, then fights Demetrius in the Fox main event. Like, these guys have not even, like, smelled top, top competition, elite, elite competition, and then they're fighting Demetrius for the title. John Jones is fighting guys, like, even, however, Vitor Belfort, what might have been a blown up 185er, who, by the way, was probably on steroids for that fight. And eh. he goes, but nevertheless, he's still, you know, fought f being a champion. I know his title win was one of the most ridiculous ever, but the, you know, Randy Couture fight. But still, he's been in there against the best guys forever. Like, he can, he has the experience. He knows what it's like to be in that situation. Demetrius is fighting guys who aren't ready to be there. And, like, that's not his fault. That's the flyweight division. Like, they, it's tough to build. There's guy you, like, you can't bring up contenders because they go two, three fights. They're, you know, in there for the title shot because there's just no one else. But... It's just, I don't know, I just don't think Demetrius is beating the guys that are as established in the sport. And Jones is doing it, you know, say what you want about OSP, I think. And I think a lot of that debate, if we ran, went and redid that debate and said, hey, John Jones was also dealing with that week of the fight with his mother, dealing with all these crazy health issues, her leg was amputated. Like, Fair point. That, if you look back at that Fair fight point. now with yep. that in mind, like, does that not give you a different perspective? Fair point. No, I agree. So I think, you know, I think maybe people are being a little too harsh on him for that. Uh we talked about it with Rez Reza Madadi earlier today, like how we looked in the Norman Park fight. Like, ring rust is so real, man. Like, we all like to think just because Dominic Cruz came back and did this crazy, crazy thing that, like, you know, all these guys can come back from a year, a year plus, two years, and, like, they're going to look the same fighter. How many – who else can you name, like, really, that's done that? That impressively. Dominic Cruz is like, we might never see that again, the way he's been able to come back and like fight at the highest level and you know, fight, win a championship after having one fight in four years. Like it doesn't happen in the sport. It doesn't happen in sports in general. So like I think you know people are giving him Jones a little too much hate for that performance. Uh, if you wipe that one away and you still look at his resume, you know, he's done so much in the sport. He, you know, should be 23 and 0, uh, should have the the longest winning streak in UFC history is 16 and one. Now he should be 17 and 0, which would have broken Anderson Silva's all time record for consecutive wins. So you look at all these things together. Uh, I just think, you know, Jones is the guy and Demetrius, he goes out there. He's, you know, finishing dudes impressively uh, five of his last seven. He's breaking records, latest submission stuff. He's doing awesome. I just don't think uh, it's enough to put him over Jones. And uh, like I said, I can live with Demetrius being number one for now, but uh, on July 9th, that ends. Nice. Well, it's as long as Jones wins. So, uh, and dude, even if Cormier wins, Cormier is another guy that does not get nearly enough love. He's done it at two weight classes. He was true. You know, he could be heavyweight champion right now if Cain Velasquez like wasn't a thing in MMA. So he's a guy who definitely doesn't get enough pound for pound love. Uh, and Demetrius, you know, he can also change the story too if he goes up to 135. Like, I don't need to see him fight Dominic Cruz or for the title right now. Like, put him do what Anderson did when he was completely cleaned out the division. No one was there. Like. You don't need to put him against a James Irvin, like, of the bantamweights. But why can't you throw him again in there against, like, a, you know, Rafael Sunsau, uh Thomas Almeida, like, you know, someone who's dangerous and would make an in interesting fight. And if Demetrius beats him, that just, you know, waits for a while. Someone comes up and he – that elevates his stats because pound for pound really means can you do it at all weight right. classes. And we've seen Demetrius lose when he's fought at 35, and he's undersized for that weight class. But he got – 
I know it was a long time ago, but he got manhandled by Dominic Cruz in that fight. So, and like, he's also lost to Brad Pickett. I know that was even longer ago. He's a completely different fighter then. Uh, you know, the fight with Cruz would look completely different now, but still like he has definitive L's on his record and John Jones has none of that. So that's, that's my take. Well, it's a, it's, it's a fair argument. You're wrong, but it's fair. No, <laughs> no it's, a, it's, it's, it's a great and, – and, and at the end of the day, I'll be honest with you, man. I feel that that literally argument is, is it the is. definition it's of splitting, splitting hairs. hairs it's dude. splitting I mean, hairs. But, so close. And I think, like I said, kind of at the middle there, I think if we went back and had that debate again with the knowledge of what Jones is going through and like maybe had some a little better perspective on his performance, I think uh, maybe I would have won that debate. Nice, <laughs> nice. Well, speaking of John Jones, a couple months ago you actually spent some time in Albuquerque. Yeah. Uh, I mean, dude, we could spend a whole show – talking about impressions of John Jones and what you think. I mean, I think people are always trying to figure out who he is as a person. Uh, I, I, you know, I've said it over the years. Uh, I think that John's always been very careful of, of how he comes off. And I think because of that, I, I think it's honestly more of a detriment to him than it is. Uh, yeah, a, I think if he was just more real and who he is, like yes, is. there would be some people that don't like him. Yeah. But I think that there would be less people that don't like him because they think he's fake. or You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I think he should just be who he is. And what you've seen, I mean, like, look at him at that press conference in New York the other day with Cormier. Like, I thought that was, like, that was peak, peak perfect John Jones. Like, too. the guy who Perfect is John him. Jones is the guy who was nice all week long and then waited when he stepped out of the octagon to get Cormier's attention so he could flip him off. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like – I'm down with all that. So it's awesome. You got to spend some time with John Jones, uh, the better part of a day, uh, from what I recall. Yeah. Give me, uh, just give me your thoughts. I mean, what, what's it like to spend time around him? How did he treat you? Uh, what were your impressions of him uh, as as a guy? Yeah. So the thing that was interesting. So uh, I was supposed to start my day by going with him to actually. It, it just worked out this way. I didn't plan it, but the day I went there was actually, and I know he has more now, but was the final court mandated like seventy public, second. Yeah, seventy final. second. F- the day of that so I was like wow that's crazy like his, uh, his publicist told me that like before the day before or something I was like wow that's unreal uh, that'll be cool to be in there and she said it was at like this de- uh, you know youth detention center that was basically like uh, the kids are forced to live there because you know whether they've checked in or are being forced to go there through like you know drug abuse alcohol abuse abandonment you know sexual abuse all these things and uh, so it was like a pretty powerful group of I think like 14 to 23 year olds so like intense stuff and uh, I met Jones and I met Jones there, and uh, the funny thing is, he he rolls up in the famous now the now famous white Corvette nice. that we saw, and uh, at first parks in front of a fire hydrant, and then hopefully realizes what he's doing and backed up into the open <laughs> no, space. He did. That was fine. <laughs> yeah, so like, oh, John, just I, I was standing there. I was like, no, I was like, this isn't happening. <laughs> and then like a few seconds later, he backs up. Luckily, he didn't Spent like get. Through luckily, he didn't like get, get out of the car and be like, oh shit, <laughs> or like someone said something. To, but anyways, so backs up. I was like, this is already ridiculous. And then comes in and. Uh, we go into the office with the lady who was like the director of this, uh, you know, this detention center. She's sitting down with him and explaining to him what kind of kids these are and like what the deal is going to be and whatnot. And just as we're sitting there, he gets uh, really nervous and starts to like clam up and is just like kind of looking at me. He's like, man, like, I don't know if I feel comfortable with you being in there. Like there's some stuff I'm planning on, you know, saying that I don't think anyone's ever heard before. And like, I've only said it one or two of these things. I was like, well, you know, I've seen other people come and spend some time with you. Like, they were allowed cameras and all that stuff. And he's like, that's why I was talking to third graders and like fourth graders. And like, right. these are like people who have dealt with serious stuff. And I'm planning on saying some things that like no one's ever heard before. I was like, well, if you've only said this to a couple of groups, like, how do you know some kid doesn't go posted on a message board or something? He's like, well, this is the final one and nothing's got out to this point. So like, I'm trusting it won't now. And like, he was just really nervous. And he's like, you know, we, I had met him before a few times. He's like, I know, like, I know you're a good guy, all this stuff. He, he did seem at the time kind of sympathetic about it. And uh, I was like, okay, I understood, you know, not going to, his publicist even tried to back side with me a little bit and say, you know, it'd probably be a good idea, but he just wasn't having it. So I can respect those wishes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if I had to guess, it was maybe some stuff about like his sister who passed away, like, sure. you know, some very personal things that he hasn't even opened up in about, about interviews and like, you know, so I understand it, but you know, that, so that was the end of that. I kind of went back to the hotel for a bit and I was like, God, this is off to a terrible start. Great. It was not great. And anyways, I met him at the gym a little later in the day and, you know, this is the first time I've ever, re- ever been to Jackson's before. So we were, you know, supposed to do it there upstairs in one of the offices. And, 
you know, that place is something else, that New Jackson's facility. I walk in there, and within, like, two seconds, I see Cub Swanson, John Dodson, Diego Sanchez in the octagon with his headphones in, like, shadow boxing like a crazy man. And you're just like, wow. And that gives you a whole, like, whole new respect. And right when you walk in the doors, it says, you know, the greatest fighters in the world walk through these doors, the big famous slogan uh, they have in there. And it was very, cool, like, surreal to actually kind of be in there for the first sure. time. Uh, so that was really awesome, and I met John. Yeah, there. I haven't been out the new one yet. I need to go. It's there. awesome, man. And I ended up meeting John there a little later. And right when he came in, he seemed very uh, sorry that like I couldn't come in, and, like very sympathetic. And he's like, "Man, like uh, you know, I just kind of had to do what I had to do in that situation." And anyways, we ended up sitting down, and we had about an hour planned for this interview. We ended up before I knew it, an hour and fifty-five minutes had passed. Like it was, it was crazy. We sat down on a couch and like it was kind of weird. It was in like the upstairs like balcony area, and he's just like lying down, like fully relaxed on the couch. I'm like sitting at the end, just talking to him. Like it almost seemed like I was like in a therapy session or, or something. <laughs> like, you know, he's like lying down on the couch, like spread out, and you know he sat up a couple times. So I asked him like a few intense. Con- questions like one of the really good quotes I put in my stories when he said uh you know one of the moments he will say in interviews now that the reason the thing that made him realize he had to get his shit together was Daniel Cormier saying you know John Jones get your shit together after that Anthony Johnson win but uh the real thing or one of the real things I think that contributed to a little bit was when he said uh his kid came home from school one day and was crying to his mom and said mom a kid at school today said dad killed a baby and he was like, that shit just, you know, made me realize because I, you know, my wife was freaking out. She wanted to, like, meet with the kid's parents right. and, you know, like, tell them obviously that wasn't the case. Like, he hit a pregnant woman who everyone knows by now, you know, baby was un- uninjured. She hurt her arm. Uh, so, like, but, of course, that's just the world we live in. It gets twisted to yep. something like that. People, you know, kind of take it how they want to take it. And uh, that was one of the moments he sat up and you know, kind of got very real and said, you know, that's when I realized I'm not just fucking this up for me. Like I'm fucking this up for my family. Like my wife has been with me since what they're 18 or I guess she's his fiance yeah, right yeah. now. He references her as her wife, but yeah, yeah whatever. Um, yeah. Like they've been together forever. He's like, I realized she didn't sign up for this shit and like neither do my kids. And you know what my mistakes are fucking up their life too. And impacting my little kids who like have no idea what, what's really going on. Don't aren't old enough to understand this. So that was something that kind of really hit me hard. And you now I've heard John do a lot of interviews, but I think that one was like, you know, the, the most real and his publicist even said like, uh, she, she was there the whole time. Not once did she, you know, interrupt. Uh, the only question he declined to answer was, uh, asked him about the settlement of the term, you know, the terms of the settlement with the woman he hit. And of course that's understandable. I'm right. sure, you know, there's probably like a non-disclosure or something cool. about that. Yep. So more than fair, but everything else, man, he was you know, very open and honest about, it. and he, you, know, you can go read that story. And like, there's a lot of quotes. I you know, just had to chop out the way I first wrote that story is 8,000 words. Holy like shit. the longest thing I had ever wrote by far. And, you know, I, I talked to my editor and I was like, he's like, get it down to 5,000. And I got around that. And then, you know, the whole thing, a lot of it was about his stuff with Cormier too. So right. once, you know, after I had written it and then, you know, he went to jail too. So I had to do some rewrites on that. Cormier pulled out of the fight, had to do some rewrites on that. So a lot of, you know, good quotes about Cormier and all this stuff are, uh, it weren't included the story, but, you know, he talked about other things too. he, gave me an epic quote about Anthony Johnson, which I was hoping to use if he had filled in that fight. He said, Anthony Johnson is a knight with a sword and no shield. Nice. Which I just thought was absolutely, you know, pre- pretty cool. perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's a great quote. And, uh, yeah, he was just you know, very honest. It was, it was very surreal. So I felt like I, you know, of course – when there's a, you know, a mic and someone around someone and like, they're going to have a certain level of protection for themselves. Sure. But I think out of anything I've heard of John, like that was by far the most, most real and you know, the stuff he gave me. And I think the feedback too, a lot of it was, you know, like, he's not a liar. It's like, I hope he's right. You know, like I hope he's, he does six on his path because his story isn't over, you know, like w- I w- this was just a portion of his comeback. And he said as much, like he had another very strong quote where he's like, you know, I, I haven't even come close to earning my second chance. Like, you no, know, I do. And I'm speaking to these kids cause I have to, like, you know, I'm not drinking or go- like, doing drugs or going to the club because i i'm not allowed like i'm not doing this and that because i have to or i'm not allowed like so he's very aware of the fact that like he everything he's done in the past year as being you know not really an option if i mean he could not do it but he would be choosing not to get his career back so if he wants what he you know had back he had to do all these things 
but he had to do them. It's not because he wanted them necessarily. And now he says he wants to do them. And at that point, it's going to take some time. It's going to, you know, people aren't going to say, people are even saying now, like, man, you booked John Jones in the UFC 200 main event? Like, man, that's that's July. Pay attention to what's what, happening about what, three weeks yeah, out. What could ha- yeah, right? What could happen between now and July, which, you know, you never know. But I, I just wonder because, like, is he driving right now? His his buddy Lutrician, who was driving around, is here in Netherlands, cornering some fighters. Who's driving? Who's driving this guy around right now? He's chilling at home. Like yeah, right? No, they have Uber, not. bro. I've used so, it in Albuquerque. They have. Uber. I have too. Yeah. I have too. Even though, strangely enough, after like someone when that whole thing happened, someone tweeted Uber, and Uber responded saying, "We do not have service in Albuquerque." Oh. And I was like, I was there last week, and I used Uber like five times. But anyways. Uh, it, it, overall, it was a great experience with Jones, and then got to uh, got to go watch him hit some pads with Wink and Brandon Gibson, who are obviously two of the best striking coaches in the game, and that was really cool to see. And then uh, we chat a little bit afterwards, and he pulled guard, on, grabbed me, and pulled guard on me, and uh, <laughs> almost got me a leg lock, but I tapped out pretty quick because <laughs> nice. I, I ain't fucking with that. And now so. you spent that day with him, and now you'll argue to the end of time that he's the top pound for pound fighter on the planet. <laughs> nah, that's not yeah, even. It it. I know, <laughs> I know how you're trying to spit it like that. Dude, I mean, I definitely uh, see what I did there. Everybody just ruined this whole argument. Uh, nah. <laughs> uh, all right, one one last hey, thing. Uh, you're writing a lot about basketball now for USA Today. Uh, tell me Just about that. I mean, is Demetrius that, Johnson article. Is this is this your uh, <laughs> is this is this your new passion, man? I mean, is there someday you can walk away from MMA and be a basketball writer? I don't think so. Basketballjunkie.com, uh, <laughs> right? NBA junkie. Where's it at? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean it's one of the perks of working for an amazing company like USA Today. Is I know you've done. I mean, you've done some wrestling stuff mm-hmm. uh, when they're out there. Uh, it's the type of company where, you know, if you kind of reach out to the right people, they're very open to, you know, accepting different t- types of work and opportunities. And, uh, you know, I basketball, before I even knew what MMA was, like I was playing basketball in elementary school and high school and stuff, like very much into it. Uh, I was like the captain of, my t- captain of my team for most of high school. So a very big passion of mine. I uh, always love watching it. And the fact, you know, once I moved to Toronto, the Raptors actually started kind of getting good. And they made the playoffs uh, last year. I just, you know, thought why not reach out to someone at USA Today and see if, you know, they need a pair of hands. I'm sure my, I live 10 minute walk from the Air Canada Center. I'm sure it would be cheaper for the company to have me go there than fly someone up and pay for a hotel. Yep. So like maybe they're interested. So kind of covering the All Star games, yeah, playoff games, did so. the work, yeah. And the editor said, you know, NBA All Star Weekend is there next year. I'd love to have your help. And it's just kind of gone on from there. And of course, you know, I'm here in Rotterdam, missing the first time the Raptors have got past the first round of the playoffs since 2001. Wow. I think they're, uh, I know we're recording this on a what Thursday Thursday night, Thursday yeah. night here in Rotterdam. I know it's going to be a little earlier, but uh, yeah, they're going to play a game two and not going to be there for either of them, but they lost game one in ridiculous fashion. But, you know, I would, uh, I wouldn't rather be anywhere else. I'm sure I knew that this week was going to coincide with the playoffs and, and next week too, but I'm more than happy to be here. I mean, MMA is always going to be number one. I, I enjoy basketball, but uh it, MMA is just the ability to do like interact with the fighters and just the accessibility and the people and just the sport in general uh, is just awesome on every level. Really love it and I I wouldn't change it for anything. I mean, it'll, I hope to do basketball stuff on the side for as long as I can. A but side gig. Yeah, it's so it's always nice and it's nice to see how other sports operate too because you know you have, like especially. Like, it's crazy. There's, at the end of a basketball game, there's if there's a controversial call or anything, the referees are available to speak to. You can interview the referees. Imagine if that was a thing in MMA. At the amazing. end of an event, you could sit down and, like, ask, you know, this question or that question about a stoppage oh. or any of these things. Like, if it's only. very professional. They'll send out an email being, like, this and this happened at the end of it. It's just a – there's a – not to call the UFC like unprofessional. It's a completely different sport. Yeah, they just don't. The way they can't up. make. It's the yeah. commission. They don't. They can't make them available. Yeah, and it's it's not even that. Like just uh, and obviously you know like the NBA is compared to the UFC like it's worth it's a way more global sport in terms of like you know the amount of money they bring in all that type of stuff. So obviously they're gonna have uh, you know more money to go into promotion and all this stuff. But MMA like UFC, uh, I really enjoy like the 
cohesiveness of just the the people the journalists how we're all you know we're sitting here in an apartment with dudes from multiple different countries working for all these different outlets and they're all awesome people and you know i don't know how much i don't really know like the nba culture but i don't know if that's as much of a thing like we're it's very probably fun. not yeah probably not it's probably so, a little bit unique yeah so it's uh it's very cool and that's why i wouldn't say like this is the best beat in the world by far like for any sport just and it's crazy man like uh basketball is basketball it's is what it is this we don't know what the hell is going to happen we don't know what news could have broken since we started recording this conversation however many minutes ago like it's chaos man always something crazy happening always something new and uh, that's what makes it so fun and exciting is just you know and every day like people want to say i never want to wake up and do like the same thing every day in a job like that sucks that'd be awful like going to the same job and you know doing the same thing over and over i know a lot of people say that sure. and we we're fortunate enough in life to have the opportunity to you know follow this crazy circus every day yes it is it's the best beat in the world there's no doubt about it so all right we talked about your on-camera work uh we're, we're, we're our conversation has left us low on frosty beverages so it's time to re-up on that as we go do that I figured what we should do is we should play your favorite interview from today out of all of them. So the people that you spoke with, you name it, right here. What was the best interview? What are people going to listen to right now? You are going to listen to Magnus Seedenblad, who is going to return to the Octagon on Sunday from a 582-day layoff, the longest of his career. And uh, he's a very interesting Swedish man. He had a lot to say about his past UFC fights and what to expect from him on Sunday. All right, Mike Bond and Magnus Seedenblad. Enjoy that. We'll be right back after we re-up on these frosty beverages. Mike Bond of USA Today Sports here in Rotterdam, standing next to Magnus Seedenblad, who returns to the Octagon this Sunday against Gareth McLennan at UFC Fight Night 87. Uh, first of all, been 582 days since you oh, stepped in the Octagon. Yeah. Uh, how does it feel just be back in fight week, you know, being ready a couple days out for a fight? Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I've been, as you said, away for a long time. That was long I expected, but it's been really good to be back. You know, I'm really enjoying is this time it's the it's the best time ever you know i'm really i think my time away really made me appreciate this even more you know i'm i'm just having a good time feel really relaxed and that's that's what i look forward to you know i just having a good time in there yeah and so what was for people who don't know what was the reason for this long layoff because it's been since october 2014 yeah, since yeah. you're in there yeah i had a surgery on my knee okay. so i had a cartilage problem so i took care of that and yeah, that's about it. I, I said I was able to fight in like January, February, but this was the opportunity I got, so, yeah. Okay, and what was the recovery process like that? Because obviously knee injuries can be tricky. Was there any points where you maybe had doubts if you would able to be come back at the best of your ability, or what was kind of the process of recovery? Yeah, of course, you know, when, when it happens and you so you rely on your body so much and your body's broken you know you know it's your tool it's what you're going to work with so of course there for a while you know you get really depressed to feel like all right maybe i'm not able to continue on the way that i did before and stuff like that but after maybe six seven months it's just getting better and better and better and then now i'm fit to go yeah, and was the most difficult part of that too, the fact that you were on such a roll before that, you had won three fights in a row, you were looking very impressive and all that momentum kind of stopped? No, actually I think I look like shit. Uh, I'm really, uh, you know, I, I'm embarrassed about my previous fight, you know, all of them. I, I think I look terrible in them. You know, when people ask me, you know, you fight in the UFC, yeah, can I watch your fight? No, it's impossible, you know. You can't watch them because I don't want people to see them. When I see them, I'm ashamed of myself, you know. So this time I'm really going to show what I'm capable of, you know, I'm, I'm just, I think I'm performing like 50% or something at the highest, it's, oh, it's disgusting the way I'll be fighting, so this time, you know, this is like make it or break it, you know, I can, I can win this fight by fighting at 50% and doing the way I've been fighting, but that's never going to take me to the top, I'm never going to defeat Chris Weidman or Luke Rockhold by the way I was fighting, but now it's time to change that and show how I'm capable of fighting. 
it's it's totally different. You're gonna see. Yeah, and what have so what have you done to bring out you know 100% of yourself in this next performance? Yeah, you know that's always the <laughs> that's always the problem. You know to bring out it when it's uh, fight time. You know, but I, I changed a lot of things in my training. I really developed a lot of new skills, and. I, I honestly feel like I'm a completely new fighter, and it's a, not just me, my trainers, my training partner, you know, everybody, like, or, oh my God, it happened so much during this time, you know? And the thing is, I need to show it on Sunday, because if I can't show it on Sunday, it's no point with it, you know? It's, it's, it's in the cage where it counts, you know? It doesn't matter how good I am at training or whatever, you know? I need, I need to make it happen there. Yeah, and do you feel like Gareth is the type of opponent that could bring that out of you? Yeah, he's a good opponent. I, I don't care, you know. It's, it's not, you know, I can fight whoever, you know. It's not about the, the guy standing next to me. It's about me, you know. I, I need to perform at the level I'm capable of, and I haven't been doing that. So that's just up to me. It doesn't care who's next to me, you know. I can, I'm better than him in every aspect of the game, you know. I don't see he has anything on me, but... If I don't get it to work, you know, ah, fuck it, it's just, it's just boring the way I've been fighting. I'm, it's, uh, oh. So on Sunday, I'm really going to put on that extra level and show what I'm capable of. So in your mind, what's that performance consist of? How do you win the fight if you're fighting at your best? How do you see yourself winning that? Yeah, yeah, just pick him apart, you know. It doesn't matter which way, you know. I'm, I'm capable of submitting him or knocking him out, you know. I'm, I'm just going to pick him apart. And if you do give that kind of performance that you want, how far do you feel you are from, you'd have four wins in a row from fighting one of those top ten guys that you can really show where your skill set stands? Yeah, it's, it's up to the UFC, you know. I'm, uh, I think I'm there, you know. I'm, I, I've been around for a long time, been trained with the best people, and I know what I'm capable of performing against them. And it's still the same, you know. I think if I get it to work, if I, think, if I get it to, if I can fight the way I know I can, in training and use all my tools, I knew, no, I can be like a champ. Awesome, without, well, oh, sorry, okay. no, without doubt. Awesome, well, uh, I think we're all looking forward to seeing you back in there, so very much for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome back to the MMA Road Show. That was Magnus Seidenblad and Mike Bond. I love I love Magnus Seidenblad. He uh, kind of flies under the radar, understandably so, but he might be one of the best interviews in the game. Just his personality is incredible. All right, while we're over here in Europe, I had to grab my man Nal McGraw, TalkingBrawls.com, because Ireland is always happening in mixed martial arts right now, one of the new epicenters of the sport. But is it going to continue to stay there? I don't know. Nal McGrath, one of the leading Mixed martial arts journalists, our favorite mixed martial arts journalists on the MMA Road Show in Ireland, of course. Let's start. Let's just get at it right away now. What in the hell is going on with your boy Conor McGregor? Oh, I, I don't know, man. I, I think there's, <laughs> you know, it's there's about a hundred ways you could answer that question. I think, first of all, it may be down to his brands, whether Conor wants to get up and step in on a media circus like what UFC 200 was going to be. Right and have to deal with the questions that he's going to ask in the press and his reaction to the questions and the answers that Nate Diaz is going to give to him. I think, you know, you know, what's Conor going to say? We don't know because we've never seen him in this situation in the UFC. Right. So I think that's damaging to his brand, first of all. Then, you know, you look at the statement he made with regards the money. That's obviously an issue. There's just so many ways you look at it. There could have been a fallout out with Dana. We don't know. But, but I think that really does have a lot to play in um, with Connor, as I said there, in relation to what he's going to say to Nate Diaz, because I think he's he's a very egotistical fighter, as we've mentioned, you know, in the past. So that's a real fascinating one for me, and what it's going to do to his brand. So, you know, maybe it w I don't think that the rematch was ever the right fight. I've I've said that openly. I think Frankie Edgar deserves the shot. I think Frankie Edgar causes Connor a lot of a lot of problems. The fight I wanted to see. He causes Connor a lot of problems. Um, you know, he's, he's so in your face. And I think the fans even want to see. We, we put out polls. You guys put out polls. Everyone wanted the Frankie Edgar fight. Yep. The UFC have now lost $45 million And, s you know, what they could have done, they could have made the fight alone on that Twitter. Yeah. Post from Conor McGregor. It got more retweets than, I think, any sports Any sporting athlete. Yeah. Ever. That's incredible. Right? 
So you put this scenario together, John, right? Where a fighter is, is training in Iceland in Molnir gym, sitting on the top of a mountain. Why don't they send the embedded team there and put pure silence there? Obviously, we know, you know, you've ESPN, you, you, you've MMA junk, you've the big boys in the sport that need their interviews with Conor McGregor. Do three or four, whatever. Right. Keep to an absolute minimum and let the fight promote himself on silences. I think it's, it, it's, it's the amount of people to me, to would tune in for that is, is incredible. I'm, I just think it's a mistake from the UFC. I know they have to go by these rules, but Dana made a comment at that, that, that press conference about um, Jose Aldo. You know, Jose's always here. You know, his, his sister or his wife had a child. Sorry, right. but he doesn't do the obligations Conor has to do. It's right. completely different. Right. I think, here's the thing. I think it's very evident at this point. I've been talking to people about it. They're like, hey, couldn't they salvage this? Couldn't they make it happen? I think it's very evident at this point that the UFC is trying to prove a point. They've, yeah, they've, yeah, they've no, made a decision because it makes all the sense in the world to just put the damn fight together and put it on USC 200 yeah. and count, you know, watch the millions roll yeah. in. And I think they've decided, no, we've got to put Connor in his place. I think there's a little bit. But here's the thing is I think that Connor had made himself kind of a sympathetic figure. When he put that Facebook post out, I mm -hmm. think most people read that, myself included, and were like, that's not a bad point. I see what you're saying there. I'm down with it. But then – it was the it was the tweet where he said, I'm back on, we've worked it out, I'm good, where I feel like that was just a major misstep. Like yes. at that point you're kind I of agree. playing with people's emotions. And I get it. I think it was a play to like put pressure on them to like, hey, I told him it's happening. You guys want to make this shit happen? You want to look yeah. like heroes? Yeah. I set it up. I put the ball on the tee. You know? But I feel like that was the big misstep. And I think that's when people kind of started to sour a little bit and say like Dude, like, what are you doing? Like, you're, you're straight up lying to people. There was a little bit of desperation about it that he, he possibly he realized the amount of money that, you know, that, that's not going to be coming his way. The fact he's not on the UFC 200 card. It looks, you know, more and more likely that he's not going to be on. I think John put out a tweet the other day saying there's going to be an announcement pretty soon. There's going to be a fight for Connor, so it's going to be 201, 202. Right. But, yeah, it, you know, it's it, it pretty much desperation all over it. But th listen, what can you do? You, you, you realize you, you're trying to play the company. It's, it's going back and forth. But there's an underlying issue as well. And we've seen it since since UFC 189. We saw Frank or Lorenzo, I think it was, through the belt on. Right. Remember the whole controversy around that? Yeah, yeah. Man, Dana White has always butted heads with the big dudes in, in the UFC. We look at everyone. Tito Ortiz, he used to manage Tito. We look at... You know, GSP, there's, there's things have, have gone on the whole time with the big poster boys and girls of the UFC. Right. There's eventually become a headbutt. And it, it looks that way, that there's something's, you know, not going down. You know, Ireland was the flavor of the month last year. We're not getting a show this year. I think it's Belfast. I don't even think that's been released. But anyway, Man, uh, Hamburg and hurt. Belfast. Ah, listen, <laughs> I don't care anymore. I'm always in trouble with the UFC, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. But th that's what I, you know, I think, you know, there's always going to be a butting of heads. The, the way the UFC has set up the whole company, um, you know, you have bigger egos. That sometimes, you know, the UFC have, uh, have promoted Conor in a way. You know, he's been on the Late Show, all the big mainstream outlets in the US. Th there's going to come a clash. You know, it's the Floyd Mayweather syndrome where he yep. thinks he deserves more money, he wants more money. You know, what can you say? It's, 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 it's a mess at the moment, really, John, to be honest, because the UFC needs someone like Conor. Absolutely. Biggest star in the sport right now. Yeah. How's it playing out in Ireland? Because, of course, he's the he's the biggest star in the sport. There's no doubt about it. You know, I, I've been saying it, and, it, and it's honest to God true. Wherever I am in the world, there's, you know, I meet somebody and I tell them what I do for a living. There's two types of people. One, they go, I don't, you know, I've never heard of the UFC. I don't know what you're talking about. Or the other one goes, what? tell me about that Irish kid. You know what I mean? And and they may not know his name, but they want to they want to know about Conor McGregor. So, uh I imagine in Ireland, at this point, I mean, he's straight up mainstream. He's as big as anybody there. Uh, so when is this impacting his image at all, or is it almost like, hey, man, he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the UFC, like this is our guy? H how's it playing out? It's very mixed, I think. You know, a lot of people, you know, I got texts off of friends who have a very passing interest in the sport. But once Conor McGregor's mentioned, you're on the, you know, the WhatsApp group with yeah. the boys and – you go, is Conor going to fight? Uh, man, listen, I know as much as you do. <laughs> that, that sort of way. And you're getting that interest. But I think the whole country is, you know, Conor, as we know, he, he's taken over from Brian O'Driscoll. He is the number one sporting personality in Ireland. The head of Maury McElroy, we've seen the Google wow. stocks, everything. It's crazy. But f f from that point of view, yeah, people are talking about People are going, you know, 
I don't think they're getting on his back. I think it's more an interest. They want to see him fight. They they, they don't know whether he's going to fight for the UFC again. People are going, is he retired? That word was going around a lot. Right. Is he retired? And that was part of the, the whole marketing. You never plan, took I it think. serious, though, no, right? No, of no, course. Right? All. I mean, we all knew that was a joke. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. But they course. took it serious. But people took it serious. That's what I'm saying to you. You know, that was clearly a, a ploy. We knew something had gone on once that tweet came out. We said it was the most retweeted tweet, whatever, of, uh, of a sports person ever, which I still find, you know, Insane. I have to look back and just go, four years ago when he was in Cage Warriors. <laughs> it's it's right? that sort of thing. It, it, it's crazy. But the word is now, you know, from – we have a friend of mine here who's in the room, and he wouldn't be a big mixed martial arts fan, but he would have been one of the people that goes, you know, is, is Connor retiring? You know, what's he doing? All that sort of thing. But, you know – that was the word that was branded around Ireland. People were generally worried, would Conor McGregor fight again in the UFC? And I think that was the major thing going through people's head. But, it, you know, it, it remains to be seen whether, you know, what's going to happen with the UFC. I, I think it's 201 or 202 we're going to see now, which is a real shame because we look at the 200 card. Yeah. We're promised so much. And, you know, as much as I love Daniel Cormier and I love John Jones, we love the trash talk, but I... Uh, I think everyone here in this room would agree the outcome of the fight. Yeah, totally. It's John Jones is going to win that fight. Yes, exactly. No there, question about it. There we go. So, is it the big event the UFC really wanted? I'm I'm honestly probably looking more forward, and maybe my mind will change. Edgar because, Jose. Well, I'm looking forward to that, but as a whole, I'm actually looking forward to next week in Curitiba. I'm looking forward to 198 oh, more than I am 200. Awesome, that is an awesome fight card. I know. And I reckon even you one as well. What do you think? What's that? I reckon we've a new champion. Yeah, uh, yeah, we very I, well may. I, I genuinely think Stipe Miocic is gonna. We very well may. You know, shooting, shooting, move, shooting, move, shooting, move. That's gonna be a lot of it's fun. It's gonna be awesome. Man. Let me ask you a question about uh, one more question about Conor McGregor. Uh, I asked this question, and it's it's just weird. You know, you mentioned four years ago he's in Cage Warriors. I remember asking him this question specifically, and and I didn't want it for a headline. Like I really just kind of wanted to ask him about it, and I think it was a, a media lunch that we were having before the Mendes fight. Yeah, and it was. Is this still fun for you? Because it seems increasingly like it's such a damn job for him, and there's and the, the weight of the world is on his shoulders, and he's you know he's he's playing the El Chapo role, you know <laughs> what I mean? He's he's playing the gangster role, and uh, you know I've always said I don't believe the things that he said is an act. It's not Chael Sonnen esque where it's like a character. I mean I I truly believe that he believes he is the greatest fighter of all time, and that all these things he says are true. But I wonder because but does he anymore? That's that's the I, question and, you have. And, and, I just After wonder. After that loss to Diaz, as I said, you know, is he going to put himself in front of the media? Is he going to, you know, go, oh, make me coffee, Nate, like he said on the show, and I think it was an NBC or one of those. those. You know, you don't know how he's going to react in front of that audience. It's it's, it's, it's an egotistical thing with Conor. And I, I thought he handled himself amazingly at the post-fight press conference. Oh, brilliant. After he lost. Yeah. I thought it was great. But you're right. To have to go back and do that again yeah. at the pre-fight press conference – Probably sucks. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Like we we saw, as you said, the, you know the post fight stuff. But that's immediate reaction when you get time to sit and think about that. You've you've created this um this brand and this thing on basically being the, the best fighter of all time, and then you know you you've time to think about that. That's when the doubts come in your mind. I think yep. with Connor, and that's that's really what I do think has happened with with, with this whole. Um, potential media circus that we're going to see at UFC 200. Obviously, it hasn't happened, but I tend to agree. I tend to agree. It's it's going to be so interesting to follow. All right, uh, can't can't talk about Irish MMA without talking about the fact that a a, a, a massive tragedy, obviously yeah. a death. Yeah. Um, scary. Uh, not a UFC event. Not not a major event. Um, so very important to note that. I mean, it's not that we haven't had deaths in the United States before. We've had we've had it in amateur competition. We've had it in sanctioned competition. We've had it in unsanctioned competition. I mean, it's happened in all sorts of, of ways. But um, obviously, massive country, massive number of events. You guys are a lot more, you know, kind of whittled down a little bit. Um, talk to me about that because I, I, I do always say, and it's, it's, a, it's a goddamn unfortunate reality, but I always say it's not a matter of if we're going to see a death it's in the when. UFC, it's a matter of when we're going to see a death in the UFC. It's going to happen. Uh, I always throw it out there. It's incredible to think about this. But Kevin Ioli, uh, a Hall of Fame boxing writer, has actually been ringside for seven different seven. boxers dying. Seven. Seen seven. seven. Shit. He's seen seven boxers pass away. Um, and I do wonder, because I know it's going to happen to me at some point. And and I love this sport, man. It's I'm so passionate yeah, about it. Of course. Uh, I, I definitely don't make light of what these guys do and these gals do. I mean, they make sacrifices. I do wonder how it's going to affect me 
when I have to watch it, and I think I'll I will have to watch it at some point. Um, watch that happen. So um, I wonder. This is again. It's it's not on the highest level of sport. I mean, there's things that we can point to, of course, of, of that maybe it could have been handled. Maybe it was just a freak accident. Maybe things could have been changed. Who knows? But just talk about the whole situation and, and kind of how it's impacted you personally and how it's impacted the scene. Yeah, it's, it, it was it was a really challenging couple of weeks. I was on you know national stations a lot talking about it, and you know you, you really don't want to speculate when something like that happens as well. So if you get the full autopsy details, you know it could have been um, a flash knockout in training. It could have been in relation to the weight cut. There's, there's a lot of issues, you know, second con- concussion syndrome. Um, it, it 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 wasn't a nice time. Because especially with how young the sport is in Ireland, and the evol- you know the growth of Conor McGregor, a lot of the mainstream channels picked up on it as a massive negative, mm. and especially one of the shows I'm not going to name the show now here, but it's the most listened to radio show in Ireland, daytime show, and we were asked to go on a few of us the day after the original thing, but there's actually no point going on because the host of the show, literally, does not listen to facts. He will not take them on board and he slates the sport so you know you're you're fighting an uphill battle with things like that and we look at the, you know i'm not you know it's no excuses in my end but if you look at rugby union massive sport in ireland a huge sport i played rugby myself for many a year i had probably eight or nine concussions during school which is which is pretty you know that, that's that's probably what I mean. standard so, right Playing rugby, yes, <laughs> because you're going in and you're you're putting your head into guys' knees, full force yep. tackles. There's been huge issues at rugby over the last few years. Nothing's ever been really said about that because the sport is accepted in the mainstream, and that's what really frustrates me. Being you know a rugby guy uh, and being you know uh, obviously a, a huge mixed martial arts s- supporter and a fan, and obviously covering the sport as well. That's what really you know gets to me. But it's been very negative towards the sport, and I think you know a lot of you know, we we Paddy retire, um, obviously Connor losing. We'd had that whole very tragic incident in Dublin at TEF two, or TEF one. It just hasn't been a good year, really, the way the sports started off in Ireland. And you know, I don't think we're gonna have a card here this year. But it, the whole reaction's been blown out of proportion because the sport, as I said to you, John, is young, and that's the problem you're gonna get. People aren't educated. We the sports minister come on a few weeks ago. We we the story about. Um, John actually met John Cavanagh, who's the um, president of the IAPA, which is the Irish Amateur Pancreation Association. Right. Uh, they're recognised under IMAF, but they're not governmentally recognised. But there was meetings last week that took place with John and Denzyme White, who's the CEO of IMAF, uh, with um, the Minister of Sport, Mr. Michael Ring, and um, Sports Council of Ireland, as well were involved in those meetings that, that's a good step that's I think step. because Mr. Michael Ring was on a radio show in Ireland and he you know he goes we have to do something about this but he, he wasn't very educated as where you could tell by the interview he made some pretty silly comments you know he goes oh I've no problem with Connor fighting here but okay w- why have you no problem with Con- <laughs> in Crow Park because there's a lot of money involved exactly <laughs> y- you nailed it in one John yeah but but that's that's the type of thing. Like it's like New York. I I prefer New York oh. because New York was was such a hard path for the UFC. There was a lot of reasons. Obviously, the color commission, Vegas, and, and New York. But once they finally got educated about the sport, it was a lot easier to sell it to them. And I think that's a lot. You know, it's it's very similar to Dublin. Yep. You know, there's a lot of very uneducated people in Ireland about the sport, especially uh, amongst the media. In you know general sports fields, right. like, like general sports shows like that. So that's that's a huge problem. But, you know, it, it, true negative things, you, you know, it, MMA has always come out on top. And sure. I think it's going to come out on top again. It, it hasn't been a great start to the year for Ireland, but, you know, we've been the, the cherry on top of the cake for a couple of years, so it's, it, it can't last forever. Well, you said it. You know, it's kind of funny. We had Mike Bond on earlier. He, Canada was obviously yeah. the, oh, the, the greatest yeah, place. That was the Mecca. Yeah. Well, <coughs> I, I wonder, I mean, I don't know if, if maybe you had a chance to see this or not. Uh, Tom Rooney, who does some freelance articles yeah, for us, I know Tom, yeah. ha- had a piece with us earlier this week where he talked to Neil Siri. Um, and and the, the angle that he went with Neil Siri, uh, and I thought it was a great angle when he pitched it to us, and I thought the article came out great, but has the Irish MMA bubble burst? I mean, with the retirements that you had, you know, you, Cajal, of course, uh, retired. Mm-hmm. Paddy Houlihan had to retire, uh, an odd situation there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the death, of course, very unfortunate. This whole situation with Conor McGregor. 
you kind of touched on it there. You said you think you'll rebound it, but his question was, you know, has the bubble burst? What, I mean, what do you think? Is this is this just a down side, or like did we get too excited? I mean, did everybody get caught up too much in the in the excitement of Conor McGregor and put Ireland too high, or or do you think this is just a downtime and we're going to see a big rebound? There's a couple of ways to answer it. I think you, you can't. How could you not get excited about Conor McGregor? First mm-hmm. of all, the way he promotes himself, but secondly, there is a huge amount of young guys coming through. And he's taken a lot of credit for that, for, for, for being the guy that, you know, made the breakthrough into the UFC, all that. And we have, you know, we've guys like Dylan Chuke, who's been an absolute killer and bam in his career so far. We've a lot of guys in Team Rhino. We've like, you know, Miles Price. Th- there's a whole generation that are stemming from that and guys who I think they believe now that they can do it. They've, you know, Neil's there, um, very much a huge cult follow here. Cult. What am I saying? My tongue tied again. Cold following? Cold following. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Frosty Bell has got nothing to do with our, that. Yeah, nothing at all it's to just do a, with it's that. Just, it's hard to say those words. So there's a lot of guys in Rhino. There's a lot of guys in SBG coming through. James Gallagher at Simon Bell. There's a whole second gen. We right. wouldn't, man, if we had one of these fighters in the UFC, you know, six or seven years ago, and we we had eight until last year. I know a lot of guys have, have been cut or lost. Right. But there's a whole generation coming through and a massive generation coming so through. So you're excited about the next I'm generation? I'm incredibly excited about the next. And Dylan Chuk, one of the guys that I'm very, very excited about. 2-0 and in Bama. And that guy, he looks like a taller, meaner version of McGregor. And he loves the talk as well. Great interview. You should get him on the road show sometime in town. It's beautiful. He, I love he's, it. He's a good dude. Well, I appreciate you going through the difficult stuff, man. Let's talk about the fun stuff. I guess basically you're here uh, to cover Neil Siri, yeah. Gunnar Nelson. Is that the, is that the two focus well, that you well, have? Well, Neil, yeah. yeah, yeah, more or less. I mean, Gunnar's like the, the yeah. he, he's like the adopted home guy. All yeah, right. no, he is. No, yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. <laughs> SPG adopted home guy, but uh, yeah, yeah. But no, Neil Siri, yeah, man. Neil, Neil, Neil. I've always had a good relationship with Neil, so. I'm very excited for Neil. I think it's great that he's been given the opportunity to fight a, a top-ranked guy like Kyoto Haraguchi in the UFC flyweight division. I've run out of options. Obviously, the, t- t- uh, sorry, the Ultimate Fighter sort of fell through. Obviously, they're not doing the flyweight thing now at the moment. I think you know if Neil is to win this fight, I think it's you know it's it's a very very tough fight for Neil. Yeah. Um. You know, you never know. Neil loves that overhand right that he throws. You never know if that landed could do damage. But I think, you know, Kyochi is rightfully the favourite going into this fight. But I think a lot of people, including yourself, would love to see Neil win this. Because I think it's a bit, little bit like the women's bantamweight division where, you know, it's when Ronda sorry, sure. w- was in charge of the division. No, and you, it's, you know, it's getting, it's getting folded out. There's no one else to fight. And if I think Neil wins this, I'm realistic. I'm not taking, taking the mick now. I think Neil... If he was to pull off the upset and win this fight, why not throw him against like? Well, we need fresh contenders. We need fresh contenders. because when you That's got a division it. like flyweight, where the yeah. champion is the undisputed pound for pound best fighter on the planet, I mean nobody can make an argument to the contrary. Uh, <laughs> what you, <laughs> you know, you need fresh contenders well, for John a massive Jones is the pound like for pound, So I don't know what you're talking about saying saying to each Oh is, man, is he doing something on my head here? Yeah. I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> awesome, man. All right, well now. Uh, of course, we see you every week on our media picks. You are one of our international media I've friends. had a horrible year this year, by the way. Junior. Have you? Yeah, and Abby pulled one of my videos as well right there. And I actually <laughs> picked it brilliantly and beautifully, and he pulled it. Thank you, Abby. Cheers. <laughs> Well, t- tell everybody else. Where else Where else can they find yourself? I mean, first of all, share anything else you'd like to share, any other things you'd like to get out there, and then let everybody know where they can find your stuff because, uh, as, as you know, you are one of our favorites, and uh, I would love for people, <laughs> if they want to uh, dive into the Irish MMA scene, they know they can get it from you. So tell them Thanks, where John, they can find uh, it. I always appreciate you, uh, you having me on. And, um, yeah, TalkingBrawlsMMA.com, Noel McGrath, for Stop uh, being rude there, obviously, Van, in the background. Yeah, no, just hit me up. No problem. You like me, you don't. Uh, it's sort of a take or leave it attitude. I speak my mind. Bang. It's done. Such an Irishman, dude. I like the way that's, <laughs> that's Irish swagger right there. All right. Well, we, uh, frosty beverages are uh, being consumed. We're going to re-up on these. Of course, if you have an Irishman in there, you've got to uh, – th- they went down quick, as you can imagine. So re-up on that, and uh, we'll come back with a, uh, a special guest. <laughs> Welcome back to the MMA Road Show. I promised you a special guest, and I brought it. The cleanup hitter, which probably makes no sense to him at all. How about the number 10 shirt? 
It's just like the MVP something. Yeah. Does that Six work? <laughs> yeah. Number 10 shirt. The number 10 shirt? I'm not supposed to be hearing you. No, feel? you can't hear me. You got to okay. move that. All right. Oh, hey, there you are. Get this guy. <laughs> Dude has listened to every episode of the MMA Road Show. Acts like he, he doesn't know how to handle our equipment. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Wait, did I just say handle our equipment? Jesus Christ, that sounded awful. Hey, I'm going to be on my own blooper it, show, yeah. my own damn show. All right. It's Abby Subban, who's just sitting here with a cold beer in hand, frosty beverage, nervous just as can be, just hilarious to watch. And there's an audience. And there's an audience. Everybody's just crowding around to watch you because they know you're just nervous as hell. And co-main event. <laughs> Who's on next, Simon Head? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> uh, no, I, I just want to give you some, some quick little props. Newest member of the MMA Junkie team, of course, uh, Fernanda Pratches. 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 There you go. Did uh, I say it right? Is, she is part of the team as well. Uh, she'll be uh, on our editorial side. But uh, you're technically the newest member as well because you're no longer just a freelancer. You're no longer just a contributor. You are now part of the staff. You have stepped up your game. Uh, and I just wanted to offer you some congratulations. Part of part of the MMA Junkie squad now, the official team. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without you, man. You, That's true. You took notice. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? No. Okay, and we'll end it there. <laughs> Drop music. <laughs> no, man. Uh, listen, man. I just, I, I did want to say congratulations. Obviously, you've been helping out for a long time now, handling a lot of our European duties. Uh, stepped your game up in, uh, in Italy. Kind of handled things. You, you and our man Pear over there uh, handled business on your own, and now you guys are doing great things as well. So, uh, just wanted to give you a, a mad congratulations. Uh, I told you about. Uh, our man AJ McKee over there, right? AJ McKee, yes. The world is mine. That guy. He's solid. He's awesome. Awesome. I think that guy's a real deal, man. I want to keep an eye on him. Let's talk about this week, uh, UFC Fight Night 87. Uh, again, just like all of us, man. Yes, this is our business. Yes, we're dedicated to it. We love it. But at the end of the day, man, we love the sport. That's why we got into it. Uh, Anything this week when you got on the plane to jump over here that you were specifically looking forward to? I mean, I know sometimes you're, you're, you're tied into your English fighters. You guys cover a ton of European events. So, you you know, you get access to some of these guys that just become kind of personal favorites, that sort of thing. Anything on this card that stood out to you that you're like, you know what, I'm looking forward to talking to that guy or I'm looking forward to watching that fight. Anything that you were, you were hyped about? I've seen him on TV and now I'm going to see him in person with a beard. Bigfoot. Bigfoot with the beard. It, well played with the beard and the full head of hair. He's looking. Uh, he's he's looking unique. I, I like the I like the way he's uh sporting the, the the full facial hair these days. Yeah, stuff like that. I mean, I haven't seen um, I've never seen him live, so I'm looking forward to that and looking forward to actually seeing how big the dude is. And I saw I I got a peek at him today when I was going back when we were shooting interviews in the back. I went past the media room, and I saw the beard. I saw the big beard <laughs> <laughs> wait wait till tomorrow man the media day tomorrow of course it's thursday night as we record this it'll be friday morning when this comes out we'll be at the media day while probably most people are, are checking this out but the first time you shake the man's hand it is a uh, it's a unique experience because it's just like it's it's crazy it's yeah. it's bizarre man it's uh it's it, it's it's he could be he could be called big hands that probably wouldn't be as great of a nickname though <laughs> big <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. It's um, that time of the night in the MMA road show. Yeah. Uh, hey, I do want to talk real quick. Uh, I did have a chance uh, earlier this week, uh, actually last weekend, uh, I had a last minute opportunity to go down to Florida. I called Titan FC 38. Uh, if you haven't checked that out on uh, on UFC Fight Pass, thank you, sir. That was thank excellent. You, sir. Yes, I was yes. just basically fishing for compliments. That's the reason I set that up there. Uh, but no, uh, I, <laughs> it was all right. It was all right. It was all right. Yeah, I had a great time doing it. I'm looking forward. To, it sounds like they're going to have me back in June, which I'm looking forward to. But it was interesting because uh, I was presented with a dilemma, Abby, and I, and I want to share the story because it was funny. Uh, I went into the night knowing that I was most looking forward, maybe not most looking forward, but very much looking forward to a guy named Peter Petty's fighting. This guy is an incredible showman. You know, he's got some. He's got some MVP in him. He's got some. Right, right, right. You know, he's 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 got this, and he lost the fight. And and I totally agree that he lost the fight. And he lost the fight because he basically just let off the gas and gave it away. Now he was fighting an awesome opponent in Cal Rocha, uh, an up and coming dude as well. An incredible matchup between two young undefeated prospects. Uh, Peter Petty's. If you haven't seen him fight before. Dude has swagger and style. He's a showman. I think he's somebody that we're going to enjoy watching for a long time. But he let off the gas in the third round. He lost the fight. Very clear 
that he lost it. Um, but it was funny because after the fight, uh, I had a chance to – this may shock you, but I wanted to grab a few frosty beverages after my work was done. I know. Of course, of course, I know. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I ran into him, and, 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 and uh, we got on the same elevator together. To I was going up to my room to change clothes real quick so I could go down and take that goddamn suit off that I was wearing because I definitely – Yeah, you not, look great. I definitely was not comfortable in that shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I was trying to get that off. You were wearing uh, shorts. You were wearing <laughs> yeah. shorts in just a place. Like, Dude. Yeah, I had shorts on underneath the shirt time. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, and some flip flops, of course, as well. Uh, but wanted to get that suit off, and so I was going to a room where we're in the same elevator, and I wanted to say something to him, and I was like, "Nah, man, that's not really my place, dude. That's not really my place to say anything to this kid. Like, he's, you know, he's having a rough night." And so I basically just put my head down, man. We were sitting in the elevator, and I, and I just, I just put my head down, and he went to his room. I went to my room, <laughs> changed clothes, came down, uh, continued to have frosty beverages for the next three hours until I had to go get my shuttle back home. Uh, and I'd had a couple beverages and as, as luck would have it, uh, as we were leaving, uh, to go to catch the shuttle to the airport to go home. Um, and I had had a couple frosty beverages at the point. I actually saw him again. He was sitting outside. <laughs> and at that point, uh, my judgment was a little bit different. You know, I, I didn't have the, I shouldn't say anything. So I just walked up to him and I was like, bro, um, keep your head up. I was like, I think you're the real deal. And I was like, I know you learned your lesson tonight. You just let your foot off the gas. I'm like, but you're the real deal. Keep your head up, and I know I'll be watching you fight for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, he actually – he said thank you. You know, he's like, dude, thank you very much for that. And he actually tweeted me later and thanked me again for the message. And I was like, dude, I'm going to I'm gonna be back, and I'm really going to do it. And I, it was kind of an interesting moment because I don't really feel like it's my job to be going in there and telling some, you know, like up-and-coming prospect fight. Like, it's, it's not my job to, like, to talk to them like that. You know what I mean? But at the same time – you know, I'm also down there 40 years old. I've seen thousands of fights, and there's times when I recognize talent where I'm like, dude, I know you're, I know you're having the worst night of your life tonight, dude, your first loss. I know you're having – but don't. Like, mm. you're something special. Keep at it. And uh, I don't know, man. I, I'm not sure if I was right or I was wrong, uh, if I should do that or I shouldn't do that, but it just felt like the right thing to do. And it's funny because sober me stopped myself from saying anything a little less sober me decided it was okay to go talk to him or whatever. So I don't know, man. I mean, what do you think? I, mean, I know that you're, you're with these guys. I know, you know, you're, you're not necessarily full-time reporter. You got your full-time gig, but now you're starting to get over into this space and really get in there. Uh, man, those type of interactions, like in some ways I feel like it, it, it's good. If I, if I can impart a little bit of knowledge or, or impart a little bit of word of encouragement, maybe I should. But in other words, I feel like as a journalist, that's not only my job. I should, I should probably, I, I probably was actually inappropriate in saying what I said. I mean, that's where the line is. Uh, it's a thin line between being a journalist and a fan. Um, I've, I found that out early, um, but I was just, yeah, I could relate. I was in Turin, and when I when I met AJ McKee, and you you briefed me on him before uh, before I got out there, and uh, you told me to watch his fight. <clears throat> I watched one of his fights that we had on one of our players. And uh, yeah, he, you said he was one to watch, definitely. So um, when I when I saw him, like I was in, interviewing all these Bellator fighters. You know, I'm not strong on the Bellator. Um, getting to know it. Sure, and, the UFC has been the brand in Europe. Exactly. Bellator's just yeah. now getting their foot in the door. Yeah, yeah. I've always shown interest. I mean, there's always been interest there. It's just that yeah, we don't get the exposure that that you guys get with Bellator. So um, yeah, I knew about this guy though because you briefed me on him, and as soon as he came up. T- uh, for the interview, he was there in his bathrobe and he had <laughs> sunglasses. Up in the bathrobe and sunglasses. Yeah, he he just looked. You saw the interview and yeah. like you know what I mean. He he looked. He he was just confident, and I just like Danny Brennan goes, AJ McKee, and I was like, okay, oh yeah. John Morgan told me about you. He said you're a prospect. You want to watch? And he was like, oh yeah. John Morgan said that. <laughs> I was like, yeah. And he's like, keep watching. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. yeah, he's definitely he's definitely um, someone that I'm excited about, and it just shows that Bellator do have talent there. Yeah, and they just need to show it. All right, let's talk about Bellator. When's the next episode of MVP 24/7 coming out? You guys have done phenomenal work with that. Our man Simon Head gave you massive shout outs uh, for that. When is the next episode coming out? What's the work going on? Tell me how they go. I know. I mean, I can't even imagine how long it takes to put that together. So, um, man. When's the next episode coming out? Bro, that's a tough one because, all right, we uh, the other one just came out, man. Relax. That's true. That's true. Let it marinate a little bit. Yeah. But, yeah, let it marinate. Let it marinate. I mean. You know what we do. You know, you know, funny we story. Up, funny like, story. Hey, you just won the title. Yeah. When are you fighting again? 
Like, bitch, let me enjoy being the champ for a second. <laughs> funny story, funny story. When that dropped, what the day that dropped, um, remember we got the, we got, we got the uh, all okay, everyone was happy with it. So you said, I'm going to put it up. You went to put it up, and then we all just jumped on it, and we, you know, started pushing it on various social media. And uh, I was looking at the stats on on the junkie back end, and I was like, oh, this is doing really well. People are clicking on it. P- good, good reception on Twitter. And then uh, I just happened to be flipping through Facebook, and I saw a tweet from um, MMA Mad. Shout out to Dell. Um, it just said Connor just broke the internet. So the moment our MVP video dropped, Connor just breaks the internet. So like I was looking at the views. <laughs> I was looking at the views and it just <laughs> and uh yeah, so Connor just kind of like lucky junkie circled it around again. But yeah, he just like kind of pissed on our cornflakes. So the headline for this interview recap should read: Abby Subban says "F you, Conor McGregor." Nah, nah, nah. There's there's always love for Conor. <laughs> <laughs> I got an Irishman standing next to me, man. Um, yeah. oh. No, it's uh, it, it's really, if you haven't checked it out, MVP twenty four seven. Uh, you guys have done fantastic work, and that's been awesome. Uh, all right, last thing I'm I gonna give no, I'm gonna yep. give out a uh, shout to Gandalf the Gray. Gandalf, you know, you know you're, Gandalf you're bringing, the Gray. You're peeling the curtain back. MMA junkie. Yeah. Pair is Gandalf the Grey. He is he is the man. That's the man there. We shot the thing. We shot the thing, but the edit, the edit is all per. Yep. I gotta give. I gotta. You know. I I I looked at it. He showed me things. I was like, yeah, this, this, this. But he was the one that put that thing together, and that's why it looks the way it does. He is. He is an editing master. He's a technological That's the wizard. guy there. And you he know, is a nonstop eating machine. Yes, he uh, likes to eat, sleep, and take photos. It's uh, isn't that. What it says on your Twitter handle? Eat, sleep. As much, dude. He's got. Look, he's sitting right here. He's got a bag of uh, <laughs> crunchy cheese curls, right? As much as he eats, he should look like me. Yeah. And instead, he's like, oh, oh it'll catch up. It's, it'll catch there. up. He's got a high metabolism. That's what it is, man. Ridiculous. We all lose it at a certain uh, age. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like Simon Head. Like, <laughs> like, like you uh, said. I said. I'm just quoting you, bro. <laughs> But he just Simon said it. I'm just quoting it. What the hell? No, uh, but Simon, Simon, Simon gave me the props last week. Simon gave me the props last week, and you know, there's a lot of love there for Simon. Simon always, you know, he's been there and he contributed towards the thing. It was great. All the people that contributed, even Mike Bond was it? Yeah, con- contributed. <laughs> it's a British thing, man. Well, uh, am I saying it right? I'm saying it right. Contributed. I can't even say it like and, that. And it's aluminum. Just yeah. get it right. Alu- aluminum. Okay. <laughs> Aluminium. Do you get this shit. I've heard this. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, 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 last little Bellator note. Uh, I have nowhere to report this, so it's my podcast, so I can say what I want uh, because I can't get it confirmed enough that my employers will allow it. Uh, but Josh Thompson, out uh, of the fight. I heard the reason he was out is that Aaron Pico knocked him out in practice. Oh my. 19-year-old Aaron Pico who, by the way, was born in September of 1996. I graduated high school in May of 1996. I am I did too. old I did. AF. Are we the same age? 1996, so, yeah? I graduated in 96. So did I. DeSoto High School. Class high school. 96. That's what's up. Yes. Wow. Wow. Uh, yeah. So that's what I heard. I, I, I was given that on very good accord. Um, but I could not confirm it enough to be able to report it. But I was told that Aaron Peak will actually knock Josh Thompson out in training. Of course, Aaron doesn't want to say anything. He feels like shit, obviously. That's not something you do on purpose. Uh, he's not yeah. that kind of guy. It just happened in, in sparring. So, uh, yeah. All right, Abby, who's the pound-for-pound pound best fighter on the planet? Pound for best pound-for-pound pound fighter on the planet. Oh, man. Oh, man. Um, yeah. John Jones. Ah, boo! What did you want me to say? Well, at least we don't have to use this segment, so that's what good. You, <laughs> what cold, did you want me to coffee, say? Cold coffee, coffee. You can scratch this one. Go ahead and scratch. What do you want me to say? No, that's what. That's a. That's a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Uh, all right. One more uh, little piece of breaking news. Uh, there's a slight chance it's not done yet. I could be jinxing myself, but I'm gonna go ahead and just throw it out there anyway. Uh, advanced discussions are happening. We'll say. Uh, that big Venator event in Milan in a couple of weeks, their uh, bizarre event, which is just full of big names and crazy stuff. 
uh, there's a very, very strong possibility that yours truly, John Morgan, and Mike Chiesa uh, will be working the English language broadcast. Some breaking news right there. Um, yeah, baby. Mayhem. Miller. Do you need us to cover it? Are we coming out there with you? I would love that. Are you Are you okay with going to Italy? Uh, uh, I, I don't know, man. I know. Last it's time tough. the food just <laughs> just gig. killed me. I just. Oh, I, oh man. If I if I lived in uh, Italy, I'd. I'd have problems. So hopefully that will happen. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll let you know. We're, we're, we're teasing it now, and, and maybe that'll happen. All right, Abby Savon, floor is yours, my friend. Anything you want to say, messages you want to send out, thank yous that you want to give, uh, just anything that's there. You want to? You can tweet your, you know, share your Twitter, whatever the hell you want to do. Well, well, um, first, first I'd like to thank my mom. No, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm no, I'm just so happy. I'm just so happy. Um, yeah, I'm celebrating tonight. Now, stop touching me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, um, I'd just like to thank everyone and thank you for giving me this opportunity. I just realised I'm on this podcast. <laughs> it's, it's just occurred to me that everyone's going to hear this. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's um, it's been good. And watch the comeback. And watch the comeback, damn it. All right. Well, Frosty Beverages all around for everybody. We've got some uh, We've got some more Frosty Beverages to consume. My man Cole Coffee back in Las Vegas. Big ups to him because he's going to be editing all this and posting it here shortly. So thank you very much for doing that because uh, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I don't even know how. I just fucking talk into this microphone and he turns it into a podcast. I don't even know how it happens. Uh, and then, you know, all the social media stuff. Follow us, rate us, review us, blah, blah, blah. You know what to do. Just more than anything. Thanks for listening. We love you, cold coffee. Damn, why do you think I burned through these batteries, too? Hmm? You have other batteries? Those are the other batteries I got. I knew those sucked. Huh? I knew those batteries were terrible. Did they just fucking... Do you have double A? Did they just go straight through them? <laughs> just two, two. Yeah, yeah, that's what happened to us in Amsterdam. As well. Burned through? Yeah, and they... Yeah, yeah, these batteries just suck. Battery. What did you use? The ones you handed me. No, what what do you normally use? Uh, Duracell, Procell. That should be good as well. I don't know, man. They were so light when you handed them to me. I was like, these this are gonna suck. This shit in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We shop at the same place. <laughs> oh no, those are those. Yeah, go on. Ha, let me feel. Huh? There you go. Nobody will look while your hat's off, bro. We promise, don't look. It's just hair, man. It's like a mask. Yeah. Just, just, just fix yourself. No one wants <laughs> to see you. Don't make eye contact, man. Don't make eye contact. <laughs> Fuck it, I'll do it like this. All right. Cool. It's actually, yeah, it is. There's no difference at all. <laughs> I thought you were going to take the hat off. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to start. Great way to start. All right, you feeling good? Yeah, sure. Man. All right, let's get it going. Ooh, ah, uh, Paul McGrath. <laughs> Ooh, ah, uh, Paul McGrath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I was at Italian 90 in New York when he scored that that goal. Or sorry, no, that was Ray Houghton when he had that defensive performance. Yeah, I was there in Giant Stadium, Meadowlands. Yeah. Oh, you came to the, you came to the stage for the World Cup. Oh, I was at 94 World yeah. Cup, man. Yeah, that was in the probably. The, the greatest day in my life when we beat the Italians. It was, it was unbelievable. That's awesome. Meadowlands, man. That's awesome. And that stadium is now derelict. Oh, yeah. Why? Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, we don't need that shit place. But they built a stadium exactly the same beside it. Yeah. I mean, and why? Why the fuck? That's how we do it in America. Yeah, it's not good enough. Let's build 5,000 more. That stadium's like 15 years old. It sucks. Let's build another one. Oh, you're the best. I love you guys. Bigger and better. It always works. <laughs> All right, you good to go? Yeah, man. We're, yeah, we're man. beveraged up. We're taken care of. That's what's up. All right. How are you going to straight up hand me a battery This is for low power? Bro? <laughs> it's so ridiculous. All right. Anyway. All right, you good? Hmm. <laughs> he, wants, he wants to say nothing that gets on the blue really. Too late. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs>